codes. Uh, they weren't able to make it today, but they're able to make it on June the 15th, where codes will be here and education for some follow-on questions. Uh, uh, very kindly, Rosie has handed out this uh, agenda. Um, we're going to try to be super focused. I understand that there, there is a hockey game later tonight, so if pardon what me in advance for <laughs> trying to, I will try to move things along. Um, but we will try to we'll try to get this done by six. So uh, uh, apologies to everybody. We'll uh, in advance if we try to have some focus. We have a lot of. Um, deep subjects ahead of us, and I know there will be more questions maybe than we have time for, but I am going to try to get this done by 6 o'clock. And let's start off with Talia, uh, finance and administrative expenditures. And also in the budget hearings, we never heard about uh, the $12 million in capital spending request for the finance, um, and I f it's, it's appropriate for us to hear about that request as well. So with that, if Talia, would it make sense if you didn't mind shifting over to the seat on that side so everybody can see you? Yes. See you even better. You know, I was kind of watching TV. You know, I was watching TV well, earlier today. We were sharing crackers. I understand. I understand. It's more as a favor to us on this side to be able to see you. I got that. If you don't mind. Uh, I'd like to talk about capital first and invite uh, Don Clark to join me just so that she can um, um, move on um, after this. She probably doesn't want to uh, go through the other issues that are here before us today. And I'll introduce who she is. Is that okay? Uh, Chairman? That's great. And, and if you don't mind, we'll, we'll try to keep things really going today. So okay. thank you, um, Director. Uh, in, the, in the capital spending plan, there is a $12 million allocation for, it call, it's called a enterprise business uh, system. And I have here with me today Don Clark, who is the assistant finance director in the, um, not finance director, IT uh, director. Uh, she works under uh, Keith Durbin's uh, leadership, but she is the project manager for this initiative. And right after this meeting, we do have a handout that we will email you. Uh, uh, to give you some more background information on this. We had planned to uh, submit um, this presentation along with the other capital questions that we had um, due tomorrow to this committee. So that, that will be included in the packet of information that you all receive uh, from us on capital. But uh, what has been recommended in the capital spending plan is a $12 million amount this is a $23 million project mm -hmm. that uh, is scheduled to occur over a two-year period to upgrade uh, metros, <coughs> um, uh, for lack of a better word, to, to take some of the jargon out, it's accounting system. And this accounting system uh, uh, will um, upgrade a system that was last upgraded in what year, Dawn? Two 19, I mean, well, we've had several upgrades, but. The original, I mean, the very original system was 1998. It was 1998, and we have had several upgrades since then. But the, the main thing that you all need to understand is that the current system that we have is the backbone for our accounting system. Um, we cannot upgrade it. It will be out of date and out of service by 2019. And it takes a couple of years to implement a new system. So what we have asked for uh, in this capital spending plan is the funding for the first year for implementation of that system. That system will not only support central and general government, but also metro schools. So this is a joint project. And the types of things that are included in there would include everything from our payroll systems. You know, people have got to get paid. Uh, basic accounting, human resources, uh, position tracking, budgeting, it is everything that we do for the entire government in terms of uh, financial systems and operations. And again, we'll follow up with the more detailed spreadsheet, but that's what that $12 million allocation is, is about. And Don, is there anything other than that you, you think that um, you want to add to that? And the time sensitivity on that, again, is that we have 
entered into arrangements with uh, companies to begin the work in July, and there are some um, specific um, discounts that we will receive if we have the funding right now, and those discounts will actually go away if we um, don't enter, finalize these contracts uh, in July. Is that correct? Which really, and I'm not talking about small <coughs> discounts, but these are poten it's potential, the potential is that $23 million project may be $25 million yes. overall. I mean, so significant enhancements if we don't uh, begin now because uh, of how Oracle does its businesses, business, and there are certain windows of opportunity uh, where you are presented an opportunity to uh, get those discounts, and we are in that window right now. So that's the time sensitivity to that specific project. And I have done a lot of talking, and Dawn, uh, I do want to give you a moment to speak. Cause she's, she's been doing the heavy lifting on this project <laughs> with uh, our team as well as Metro Schools. and. I've got a Metro Schools person, uh, Hank is back here in the back, and um, so I'm sure that uh, he would just wave his hand and say, yes, we need this, <laughs> <laughs> um, and we need to move forward on this. It, uh, it's an important initiative to them as well. And we've heard over the past few years that Metro and Metro Schools needs to collaborate more on these technology projects. This is a perfect example of where that has happened so that we aren't trying to duplicate services because they have an immediate need for some things. So if they didn't partner with us, then they may come in here and ask you for another $23 million to implement their system. So, they, so this is shared service between the two? It's yes. cost sharing yeah. agreement? So uh, this $23 million will cover the share of uh, Metro schools as well as the general government. So this is the whole thing. There won't okay. be an additional amount coming to you from Metro schools, and we talked about that and agree that's the best way to handle that. Okay, thank you. Questions from the committee? Uh, Councilman Glover? At, at the risk of sounding rude, I'm in sales, and a lot of time mm -hmm. in sales what we do is we'll offer an incentive on the front side to mm -hmm. try and get you to close a little faster. Mm -hmm. And I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. Okay. What I don't like is, once again, I feel like we're getting pinched, that we've gotta go ahead and we've gotta do this. We've gotta do this right now because we're gonna lose, quote, two, maybe $2 million. I believe that if we will start changing and if we're going to take the take the opportunity to change as we go forward with this, you know, I just don't like the fact that the council gets this, we get a couple of weeks to look at it, and then we have to say, okay, go do it, okay. because we get squeezed. And so that's just my two cents worth. I'm not saying that we don't need the equipment. Yep. I just don't like the timeline that we're constantly faced with. And I, and, I, and I understand that because it made us uncomfortable as well, because we told them, we said, if, well, if it doesn't get approved, then we just don't move forward and we can't we can't meet that then we'll just have to come back to the table and renegotiate i mean i think that's what you told them don did you not <laughs> okay. is you know we are where we are uh, uh councilman swope i'm not on the committee so no oh, yeah. well uh, well we're pretty informal all right then councilman mendez <laughs> I, I was just going to ask uh, is there was there a thought at some point to doing this from four percent funds as opposed to the capital uh, it's budget it's too big of a project to do with four percent what we might have available in any year in total for four percent is probably 20 plus million dollars so what this means if you decided to do a project like this with 4%, that would be everything. You couldn't do cars, you wouldn't have any other IT infrastructure. You'd, it simply would zap the entire availability. Councilman Swope. This, Don, I don't know your last name, forgive me, but um, what, what platform do we currently operate on? We currently have, um, this is the for the full ERP solution that we're that we're basically migrating and 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 implementing and replacing uh, so we have right now we have our main ERP system is Oracle JD Edwards um, and that's the one that we've had since 1998 we also have our our procurement system I procurement I supplier kind of procurement <coughs> up to receiving contracting um, sourcing that's in Oracle e business suite so this, this project is to migrate what is currently on J.D. Edwards to Oracle eBusiness Suite, which has better and fuller functionality for public sector and for schools and, and to meet the gaps, which was an assessment we did um, last fall to, to look at the gaps and what can meet those, meet those needs for 
general government, central HR, and schools. Thank you. Councilman so, so essentially we're migrating everything into e-business suites? Correct. Okay. Everything. With some implementation of some, some uh, Taleo for some combining some other HR. systems for, from HR and recruiting and learning management. Are you dealing directly, are we dealing directly with Oracle on this or, or is there a third party? Uh, I, what I'm trying to come to here is why is this $23 million? Yes. I mean, it's not just Oracle. I mean, the, the, it's the Oracle, Oracle and the reseller mythics is where the, where you get the kind of the migration of the software and the purchase of the, any of the new software that's required. And we had an RFP uh, earlier in the year that was for the implementer. So you have, you have a chunk in, of what the implementer and the, the presentation that's going to be sent out later has the breakdown of, of all the costs and how they divide up, um, not only by the types of costs, because we also had to build in some some costs to backfill our operating resources because we have we have a, a large chunk of re resources that in order to set it up properly we have to have the experts but the experts have a day job so we have to we have to figure that out so we've got we've got the information in terms of what all the categories of the costs are as well as how they split out across the big kind of groupings in a pie perspective like for the you know HR benefits payroll uh, procurement procurement and spend and then the financials one last question yes sir. so mo moving forward this is a two-year project I'm assuming 12 million now 11 million next year exactly. mm -hmm. all of this stuff comes with the licensing fees correct does that cover the licensing fees for the two years or yes. is that a five-year license or a 10-year license or it covers the it covers the licensing it, all the things to do with kind of the the new project while you're in the project it covers those licensing fees during that time and then by the third year after it's operational those will those will be part of the operational budget which we have we have budget for that budget today now. okay all right and it actually when it gets combined that some of those licensing because it's combined into one system instead of two it actually some of those yeah, I, I would i would assume our licensing price would yeah. decrease not correct. in half but correct it should be you know no more than two-thirds of what we're paying right now if we're combining both systems between school and operational so thank you mm -hmm. okay council lady wiener did i miss did somebody address the average life of this system how long would you expect it well, you'll have upgrades during the process, but right. the last one we did was back in '99. I mean, these are so they they're pretty. <laughs> yeah, well, once you get, I mean, the the last major you know implementation of this kind of size and scope uh, was in 1998, um, and we've essentially done. You're on about a five-year cycle of, of upgrades to, in order to keep in order to keep the regulatory like for payroll w-2s and, and 1099s and all those kind of things just from an operational perspective when you have to do these upgrades <coughs> do we need an implementer for the upgrades as well as the software going forward or can we do that in-house we always we have we have an implementer for upgrades as well as yeah software okay. I mean once you're once you've purchased, or in this case, we're migrating a lot of the licenses, um, you know, after that, after this is live, you know, it, it's just going to be support and maintenance annually. So you don't have to purchase new licenses but at that you point. You do have staff on board to do small tweaks. Oh, yes. That's yes. what I think she's yes. getting to yes. along the way if you identify new reports and things exactly. like that. She has so we don't have staff to, to do that. that. Yeah, I have yeah. a I have an entire team that that's what they do. They okay. support this system. They, they have business analysts and some internal developers, and that's mm -hmm. what they do every day. Okay. One last question, Chair, and I'll be done, I promise. Um, so in terms of the procurement of the equipment is or in the software, is Oracle the only one out there that's in this space no. that does this she did an RP. Yeah. yeah I mean the, the the software is Oracle software we mm. purchase it through mythics who's we, who we the reseller that we have contract with um, the uh, the hosting that is you know if it requires new hosting mm -hmm. we went out to RFP for that the implementer we went out to RFP so but but I understand that we went out to RFP but is there who else in that space is out there in the world besides Oracle? Not for Oracle or, software, there's not. Okay, so we, so they're proprietary, and in order for us to migrate to something else, we had to stay in 
the Oracle family? Yeah, we already okay. own two Oracle family That was products. my question. Yes, correct. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you, Councilman Hager. Yeah, you said there were licensing fees after the second year. Do you know how much those are every year? The support, uh, the support and maintenance is essentially 22% of the original license cost. So, so basically, the better the better rate you get on the on a migration or purchase of light of licenses, then the the, the lower your support is going to be on that. And then uh, Taleo is actually uh, a cloud subscription based, so it's it's is that in the contracts. So it doesn't. I mean, how long is it for? Ten years, fifteen years. That's, that's what I'm asking. Wait, the the twenty two percent of well, the license, support. Yeah, the license fees. Are they just every year or what? Yeah, it's just an annual support and maintenance, and and based on the contract, they can they can increase them by a maximum of like five percent each year. Okay. And you indicated that y'all had put these out for bids, is that correct? Is Not the Oracle licenses, <laughs> but right. the implementing. Hey, do you know of any other cities that are using this system? Chattanooga does, Memphis does. Um, okay. I could I don't I don't I can't I'm not a Oracle salesperson, they'll know all of them. Yeah, there's, <laughs> well, there's a lot. I mean, e-business e e suite is kind of the is kind of the in the in the <laughs> public sector world. We're kind of the exception in J.D. Edwards, which is what we're using today. We're kind of the exception to that because it's more manufacturing based as it's kind of wheelhouse. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, trying to move. Oh, Council Lady Hurt, did you have a question? This is not technical, but have you all requested uh, this expenditure before in, in one of the previous budgets? No. No. So why now? I mean, why you wait to? This is 18 years of IT. I mean, usually it's so. Software sometimes has EOLs, right? It, just, it reaches end of life. Like if if they're not continuing the platform by 2019, we're still two years ahead of it, but it's still kind of crisis level. It'd be like if Microsoft ended support for Windows XP. <laughs> It's just done after that. You're then on a dead platform and your computer starts to become a brick. Right. I mean, that, that that's why I'm asking, why didn't we ask for this before now? I mean. <laughs> the EOL might not have happened until relatively recently, but. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, for for the years since that 98, we've, we've done every five years or so, we would do upgrades. And at the point, oh, I thought you said that the last upgrade was in there. No, the the last major kind of implementation of this scale, kind of going to a whole new system, was in 1998. We had we had upgrades, which were just like a version upgrade okay. since then. And and basically, uh, at the point that we implemented I procurement about five years ago, and and since then we've been looking at strategic strategic direction on. Is it feasible to combine into one platform, and what would that get for us? And so, basically, we upgrade. We did our, our last version upgrade in 2014, and we're kind of right in the middle of the cycle now, where we did an assessment to see if that was the right direction. And and that's and we did that assessment with general government schools, all the all the ex experts in those modules and they were it was a resounding approval by them that you know in order to meet these gaps that because it because otherwise they were they've over the last couple of years made their own requests for whole new hris systems to be standalone and so this is to address all those gaps and, and the issues we reported so thank you very much any any further questions just so you are going to send us the breakdown. Yes, we've, we've got it prepared to send with the uh, response to uh, all of the capital questions uh, tomorrow. And then yeah. just one brief. Yes. And also, how on the bonding issue that we're doing on this, what, what amount of time would you be looking at? Are you looking at a 10-year bond, a 20-year bond, or a 30-year bond? This would just roll into the overall capital spending plan, which means 20 years, you know, is our normal schedule. 20 is the normal? Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, and I want to thank you both very much. Um, again, okay. thank uh, you, uh, folks with administrative <laughs> expenditure okay. questions, maybe the best thing to do is, Talia, is just to circulate answers to those questions and any, unless anybody has a specific one they want to bring up, and then we'll just keep moving through our program today. Uh, any, any, any specific administrative expenditure questions anybody wants to bring up right now? 
did I received you want to... an email from my councilman Cooper, so I, I will just read those and give you responses to those or take any other additional questions. Is that how you want me to do that? Well, so okay. As, if, would you let's, prefer? Uh, uh, um, well, that would save you having to type it out. If you just want to go through that list I was, pretty quickly. I would just read what the okay. question was and provide you a response to that. Thank you. If that's acceptable. Yeah. Oh, that's great. We'll okay. just move, uh, move along. Uh, the first question was, um, is the employee tuition reimbursement a new program, and do we offer this in another form? Uh, what has been proposed in the uh, mayor's budget is a hundred thousand dollars for a tuition reimbursement pilot program. And that is envisioned to provide um, tuition, not reimbursement, but assistance to employees that decide that they want to go back to college. And upon successful completion of a class and a department head saying that they agree that that job is, um, that the class is job related, then they could receive up to a $500 kind of check for successfully completing that class. So we aren't trying to cover the entire cost of a class. It's a pilot program just to see if there is some interest around uh, tapping into those resources because the mayor was just interested in um, uh, Metro employees having that as an option. So uh, that's anticipated. We, we'd anticipate getting the instructions out to the departments uh, on how to submit reimbursement requests after the Metro Council takes action in terms of any kind of an approval. We didn't want to get ahead of that, but that's what that's envisioned to be. You, um, you know, with everybody here, Talia, if you don't mind, can we work together and come up just with answers and circulate them in, in Rosie's packet of these questions to the committee and then move on with our with the rest of our program? I think that would be awesome, and I'm very grateful for you coming up with these answers. Okay. But let's circulate those. I see General Funk is here. Uh, okay. I know he's always eloquent, I'm but I'll ask him to be brief, too. I know he wanted to spend a moment on a wish list item. Um, if you'd come up, General, and um, just <laughs> tell us what we need to hear. Uh, uh, DA, for saving yeah. me. <laughs> Thank you for having me back. Um, but before I get started, I wanted to just acknowledge a cross section of our office is here with me today. If y'all could just stand up, assistant DAs. Um, these folks are, in my opinion, the best law firm in the whole state of Tennessee, and I appreciate their uh, diligent efforts to try to make sure that this community stays safe, that uh, the administration of justice is fair, and that as a community we're healthy and I appreciate them being here. I don't want to get too much into their business, but for instance, Byron P, raise your hand. Byron P has been with us for three years. He's still carrying uh, law school debt. He pays $1,000 a month for law school uh, debt. Just about everybody in our office that joins our office does have law school debt, and, uh, and that's one of the reasons why this is such an important issue uh, to me, because by the time you get done paying uh, student loans off in housing there's uh, the question is can you afford to still be in this type of public service and uh, so I appreciate all y'all y'all can have a seat but thanks for being here um, when I talked in front of the council a few weeks ago uh, I pointed out a, a couple things and and, and uh, so I'm not gonna I'm gonna try not to be too redundant on this but basically uh, we're in a situation where because of a study that was done over a four or five year period that was enacted in last year's council, uh, every lawyer that's hired to work for Metro Legal and every lawyer that's hired to work for the Public Defender's Office has a new pay scale as of July 1st of 16 to where they start out at $61,000 and can top out at 148. The district attorneys start off at $47,000 and top out about 120 to 124. So the district attorneys are currently making roughly 25 to 33 percent less than public defenders. To put that in another way, if someone is arrested for being a child molester tonight and they go to court tomorrow and they're represented by a public defender, our community has decided properly that the person that represents this person charged with child molestation should be paid $61,000. But the person who's in charge of protecting the community, our 
community thinks should only be paid $47,000. Uh, that, that's wrong. Uh, and in fact, the pay scale is such that it takes about five years for a district attorney to be making the same as an entry level public defender. In fact, Byron Pugh, who's been with us for three years and is now prosecuting major felonies in criminal court in front of Judge Cheryl Blackburn, makes less than an entry level public defender who just graduated from law school last month. Uh, that's wrong. Um, when, back years ago, there was a pay disparity where DAs were paid more than public defenders. And when Councilman Briley was on the council, he fought hard and the whole council worked hard to say that as a council and as a community, we want to make sure that attorneys that are representing the people of Metro are paid, are paid the same. And thanks to the council's efforts in those years, they got pay equity. And, and that's a good thing. That's one of the reasons why when this got out of kilter, I think it's pretty much common sense to say we need to make sure that we get this back in balance. Um, $10,000 uh, of an extra uh, metro salary would get us in the range to where we would feel like we are uh, being treated uh, about the same by, our, by the metro government. And I think it's fair, I think it's right, and I think that the people of our community deserve to have uh, lawyers who are protecting the community who are paid the same and valued the same as those who are representing those who are charged with crime. It means a lot to those folks who are here and those folks that are still in court and those folks who are back in the office who are assistant DAs working for the people to know that this body values them as much as they value the public defenders. Thank you, General. Questions? Councilman Glover. Very, very quickly, you said uh, roughly $10,000. There's a $14,000 disparity in the start, but you're saying overall to bring everybody into play, it'd be about $10,000 per head. So well, you're talking about 70 lawyers roughly? That right. Be, okay. Right. And, and, and they would start out a little bit lower, and at the end they would be lower, but but over the course of their careers it would be roughly it would be roughly it would even out. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Thank you. Leonardo. Two, fun, I mean, two questions, General Funk. Uh, the first one is, how does this compare with other jurisdictions? And then the other thing would be uh, your attrition. Are you having a hard time keeping DAs because of this disparity? Many jurisdictions, the DAs are paid higher than the public defenders. Many, probably most jurisdictions, they're paid roughly the same. We're the only jurisdiction in the country where the public defenders are paid higher, higher and substantially higher than district attorneys. With regards to attrition, in the last six months, we've now lost four lawyers. Um, one took a slightly higher uh, salary working for a firm. One took a like an $8,000 bump to go be a lawyer for TBI. One took a uh, bump of about $10,000 to prosecute in Memphis, of all places. And one took about a $10,000 bump to go work for the State Department of Health. Um, these are people that we have invested as a community training time, effort to get them up to be the point, at the point where they can be trial lawyers and then all of that investment is out the window for eight to ten thousand dollars to other government agencies. All right, This is not somebody, we'll have people who leave and go into private practice and make a lot more, but we should not be rated by other government agencies and uh, Don Diener reports that as, a, as the public defender, her attrition rate was greatly cut when the council uh, raised their salaries last year and so in the last 12 months she's seen a lot less attrition and I would hope and expect that we will see a lot less attrition if we get the, a similar bump. Thank you General. Any other questions? Oh, oh sorry. Just, just the last just question. Sorry. Um, on the agenda tonight we are talking about body cameras. I don't know you've had a chance to weigh in on that. How does that affect your office as far as workloads or otherwise? Um, we figure that if body cameras get fully implemented, uh, we will need uh, paralegals at a rate of about one paralegal for every 40 body cameras and one lawyer for every for every 10 paralegals. Um, but we're going to wait and we're going to see before we come to the council and say these are what our needs are. Uh, Hendersonville, uh, not Hendersonville, Goodlesville has already gone to some body cameras and so we've got a little bit of a, of a test run on how we're doing these. these. These body cameras were just implemented. We're getting our first cases in that have some body cam. And so we're going to know a whole lot better about what type of, of uh, personnel we're going to need to handle those. But we're going to be good stewards with, uh, uh, with the, the, the allocations that, that we've been given by the council to try to make sure that we can do it in an efficient and an effective manner. Great. Council Lady Hurt. Um, have you thought about 
being able to, to um, incrementally um, adjust the salaries, being based on the uh, time and longevity of some of your um, VAs? There, there are uh, built into the district attorney pay plan uh, that has been since the 1970s uh, of step raises per year. Uh, as, as far as what this request is, uh, I think it's similar. It's a year late because we probably should have been increased at the same time that we did the public defenders and the Metro Legal. And obviously not only are we a year late, but they weren't, they weren't slowly built to this. This was a one-time shot back in July of 2016. And so, uh, you know, look, I don't, I don't turn down a nickel, right? Not, 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 but, but, but this is the type of fairness issue uh, and uh, importance for those who are doing the work of the people that uh, I think it's important that everybody that, that uh, signs up to be a part of this law firm, to protect right, I, this community. I understand can, the can, adjustment, can the salary right. adjustment, but I'm sure you probably have some who've been there for uh, three years or two and one, and just wondering if you would, if it became necessary to prioritize um, the adjustments and, and at some level, um, would that be a possibility? Um. We're all doing the work of the city. Uh, people who are in their 40s who have children and have those issues uh, have certain financial constraints that sometimes people that in their 20s don't have. On the other hand, people in their 20s sometimes, because they're making less, have extra burdens and maybe they've got more active uh, student loan debt. Uh, I try to be fair. Uh, because, in fact, even when somebody is topped out, if somebody's been there with us 25 years, that gap is actually larger than the gap between the DAs and the public defenders at the starting level. And so that's why I, I'm making the, pro, the proposal to have just a flat, it's going to be this much, it's going to be the salary plus 10, uh, and, and that's why I thought it was the fairest way to go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you so much, right. General, for being I, here. I Always appreciate a pleasure. the incredible amount of work that this committee and this council has done, and I appreciate y'all's support. Thank well, you very again, much. Well, again, I appreciate you being here. Every word's important, but we are going to try to yeah. keep moving. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt Wilshire, I see, is here. Uh, Matt is here. He was scheduled in the regular budget hearings, which ran late. He would very kindly was willing to postpone his appearance to another date. This is that date. Uh, he has a handout for us. Uh, we're grateful for him to being here, and the subject is Metro's incentives budget. The councilman is being kind. He was uh, accommodating of my schedule as well, and so I appreciate that. I got to see my 11-year-old uh, son star in the school play, so thank you for accommodating this. I, I want to keep this as short as possible for you all. Um, the presentation that's going around uh, details there are two. Uh, the first details uh, the sort of work of uh, the mayor's office of economic and community development, and the second is a spreadsheet that details. And, and both of these have been distributed to you previously, although these are updated for uh, recent uh, recent incentives. Um, and so wanted to pass those around. I'm happy to. Walk through it quickly, take questions, uh, do whatever this committee like. Or simply say, go Preds, and then move on. <laughs> take that for granted. OK. So um, just start on. Sure. Um, well, uh, so just being very brief, there are essentially uh, um, four entities involved in economic development in Middle Tennessee, the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce, the State Department of Economic and Community Development, uh, at Tennessee Valley Authority and the mayor's office, and we work very closely together. Um, the mayor's office, and I think the focus of this meeting is really on incentives. Um, I have said to you all before, and I will say again, I think the incentives are a very small piece of what we do. Uh, they can be critically important as a decision-making factor. When companies are evaluating either relocating to Nashville or uh, expanding in Nashville, they frequently have hired a site consultant, 
looked at 200 cities, narrowed that down through uh, analysis, database analysis to 15 cities, sent out RFPs, received responses, visited five or six cities, um, had interviews, discussions, and at that point, things are very, very close between each of those communities typically. And so at that point, incentives uh, are can be uh, the differentiator. But it is getting from 200 cities down to the final two or three cities um, that is the main work of this council. And that is things like uh, a low tax rate, an attractive place to live and work, a talented workforce, and all the other factors that are tremendously important. Um, but you all asked to discuss incentives, so there are uh, th really three buckets of incentives. There's a fourth, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but the three incentives, um, first for small businesses, um, the council, this council I believe is familiar with the Small Business Incentive Program. I know Audra Ladd has presented twice um, and unfortunately she can't be here right now. She's at a conference um, studying inclusive economic development opportunities right now, um, but she gives her regards to you. So there are small business incentives. There's a page in here that details the uh, 10 or 11 entities that have received that. Um, unfortunately I don't have page numbers, but it's, um, it's about this seventh or eighth slide uh, back uh, are the small business incentives and who the recipients are. It's titled Small Business Incentive Program. Um, for large businesses, there are two programs. Uh, one is a cash grant per job. Uh, this council uh, offered that to Warner Music, to UBS, uh, and a number of other entities. And then the second category is a property tax abatement. Uh, the cash grant per job um, by the statute is uh, only available for projects that are reasonably expected to add 500 jobs in Davidson County over a five-year period. Uh, the pilot program, payment in lieu of taxes or property tax abatement program, doesn't have that restriction, but given sort of practical, some practical issues with it, we typically have only used that for larger uh, projects. The smallest project that this council has, um, or that any council has offered a, a tax abatement for was for a project that added 155 new jobs. That was done in conjunction with the construction of a $200 million uh, data center. So both the per job cash grant and the property tax abatement are geared towards larger projects. Um, we've been very blessed. We've had um, 15 or 20 of those type projects um, that we've done. The other category of incentive um, can be typified by what we've done with, uh, with uh, Lifeway, in retaining Lifeway in, in uh, Nashville, um, and what is, quite frankly, somewhat loosely proposed uh, for the IKEA development in Century Farms, um, and that is investments in infrastructure. Um, you know, quite honestly, these are things that the city should be doing anyway, providing roads and connectivity and infrastructure. It is a huge priority of the mayors uh, to really focus on infrastructure investment so that as we have economic development, that the infrastructure matches uh, the growth in the city. And so we've done that in a couple of occasions and are looking to make sure that we continue to invest alongside where the, the jobs and, and people are coming. So that's an overview. I can go into detail on any one of these incentives or uh, answer whatever questions you all have about either our philosophy and our approach or on specific um, projects. Um, Councilman? Councilman Glover? I, I just want a clarification. I thought with Bridgestone there were 1,100 jobs we were retaining. They were adding 600, which would take us to the 1,700 number. And then they, they added additional numbers on top of that because they've, they've decided to bring more staff from around the country. Yeah. Am, I, am I remembering that wrong? You remember it exactly right. If you look from the third from the, bro the bottom, there was the original Bridgestone deal when they okay. had 1,112 employees. They were committing to add 607. Um, quite honestly, once they began that consolidation process, they found that more people wanted to be in Nashville and they wanted more people here. Uh, they had built some extra space in the headquarters, which has now been topped out and the signs up on top, I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, but they quite frankly have filled that building up plus some. And so both in terms of business diversification, where they had their employees, risk management, and because of uh, higher than expected demand, they came back and said, look, we'd like to have another further expansion, and what we did in that case was not transfer any of the property tax abatement, but we did say the commitment we had made to you of $500 per job in the downtown location also applied to the location that they took in the former Hickory Hollow Mall. Um, that 
building actually is going to have a ribbon cutting later this month. They are open and getting ready to move in there. So then we took 1,100 jobs, retained them, high paying jobs. If I remember correctly, 93,000 was the average salary. You have a good memory. All right, and then, uh, so we, instead of getting the 1,700, we're gonna be at about, we're gonna top out at over 2,100. So we've almost more than doubled the, the number of people that we brought in with, with well paying jobs then. That is correct. And we got a pretty nice building downtown, but even more important to me than that, is their existing location is now available for the next person to move into. Having available office space uh, right now in Nashville is uh, quite important. We don't have as much as we need for the interest that we have in the city. And we're not offering any incentives on that piece of property that's already that's existing, right? We're not, nothing's going there as far as incentives are concerned. Well, well, not, okay. Nothing has been proposed yet, I, I don't know. but. But, but it has not been the practice of this council historically to offer property tax abatements on existing buildings. There is a caveat. Um, in two instances, this council did provide an abatement on a portion of the increase in property taxes at three locations. And so when companies came in and said, hey, we're going to make a big investment in this building, the first example was Oberto, the second was American Standard, which ended up not actually moving forward, uh, and the third was Assurian's location in Antioch. The companies came in and said, look, we're going to make tens of millions of dollars investments because these buildings are not adequate and we said okay here's the deal if you end up choosing Nashville if you end up bringing those jobs here we'll agree to abate 50 percent of the increase above the baseline and so I think it would be unlikely that a company would make that kind of substantial investment in an existing office building but no the, that's a longer answer the short answer to your question is no there is nothing currently on the table for Bridgetown's existing headquarters thank you chair thank you councilman sledge um, on the small business incentive program, Matt, uh, it mentions it says it's approved three small business job grants, but there's eight. Is that just a typo? I just it is a typo. I, so I updated this presentation and I updated the list of companies, but I did not go back to no, update no, 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 uh, no, that. No, I apologize. No, that is my fault. No problem. No problem. What I was going to ask is most of it looks like most of these companies, at least from familiarity or just looking at their names, fall into either healthcare or technology. Is that typically how our small the, the folks who've been applying? And these small business grants, are they typically falling into those buckets or are we seeing a wider uh, range of industries? Yeah, no, I mean, those have been the, the highest category of applicants. Um, and, and just to refresh this council's memory, the, there is no sort of discretion on our part or we, when we created this program, when you created this program, there was no additional staff. Before it was me and Chris Parham, now it's me and uh, Audra Ladd. Uh, Justine Avila, who's in the back uh, there, continues to be the executive director of the Music City Music Council. So there's no discretion. We created a very streamlined process. If you apply and you qualify, you get it. Um, and so um, the requirements of this program are that the company have 100 or fewer employees globally, anywhere, and that they add 10 or more in Davidson County in a 12-month period, each of whom makes more than 80% of the average wage. The average wage for the national market is $43,950. 80% of that is about $35,130, I think. The data may be here. Um, and so when you think about what companies are adding 10 people in a 12-month period, each of whom makes more than $35,000, it's not surprising that that's primarily technology and healthcare companies. And so that's been who has applied for that piece of it. The Blighted Property Grant has had uh, a much broader array of uh, both geographic locations and types of investments. And if it's okay, I want to ask one more question. Where are we on the funding on each of those? I know we had the initial amount. What have we drawn? Yeah, so it's a great question. In this budget, there is, so we've we've expended, um, I don't remember the precise dollar amount. I actually could probably pull it up on a spreadsheet, but I think we've probably spent three or four hundred thousand dollars to date, um, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, but there, but at the end of each council year, fiscal year, those funds expire. They had been rolled over previously. What is in this budget, so essentially what is being reserved for going forward is $300,000. So essentially, based upon how the budget has been laid out, you all are authorizing us to uh, make $300,000 of commitments to small businesses and to investments in under-invested uh, areas through the blighted, what I called, but Audra does not like to be called, the Blighted Property uh, Grant. So. Um, Matt, you know my concern has been for quite some time that the small business incentive program really doesn't meet 
a lot of small businesses. Yes. And I would really like to see something created that will meet more of those businesses that may not have the um, more than 10 uh, people or less than 100 or something that meets those that are true small business. And I would like to know about the follow-up and accountability on the, um, the, um, the incentive, the, the pallets and the incentive programs that we have. And, you know, I'm also concerned about the minority and um, female population that these, biz these corporations hire or do not. Yes. So if you can speak a little bit, I'd appreciate it. Sure. You have been a consistent advocate uh, on both of those issues. Um, I'll address the small business one first. Um, as I referenced, when we created this program, we tried to make it sort of streamlined. We were targeting what we were trying to uh, do, which was attract fast-growing small businesses. That was the sort of stated purpose of this, to make sure that we weren't just helping large businesses, but that we were directly supporting small businesses. Um, there is a balance in any of these things, of course, between just sort of saying, you know, if you hire one person, you qualify, uh, and saying setting the bar extraordinarily high. Um, I, I, and, and I'm really speaking about Audra's area, so I should, I should be careful about what I commit Audra to. But it has been the mayor's priority and remains the priority uh, of this administration to explore creative alternatives to solve problems that are out there. And so I implore you, help us be better if there are things that we need to do or other programs completely different from this. Um, I say all the time to folks, I said it twice yesterday to different groups, I'm a big believer in plagiarism. If Indianapolis has figured out a great way to do this, we want to copy it. Um, but given the various constraints that we have, both budgetary constraints, uh, practical manpower constraints, we want to make sure that we're being efficient in, times, in terms of what we're creating and who it's serving, but we want to be better. And if there's a way we can be better, help us do that, please. In terms of the follow-up, um, as you know from your time on the Industrial Development Board, um, Companies uh, come in and uh, present to the Industrial Development Board. They report the um, various statistics on their employees. The board has been uh, consistently asking not just for um, the demographic profile of the employees, but also uh, where they uh, reside. And so that's something that uh, has been reported to the Industrial Development Board, and we're continuing to follow up on that. And, and there are not requirements. Um, we, we, we don't think. We don't, given where Nashville sits, for instance, on geographic issues, sitting in the middle of the region, we think we get more than our fair share because one of the attractive things about being in Davidson County is that you can attract employees from all over the region. If we put some sort of requirement that said half of your employees have to be in, in Davidson County residents, we think that would be counterproductive to overall economic development efforts. Um, but we do think that we can apply some pressure, and you have applied that pressure to companies to try and guide them uh, towards making sure that their employees represent the citizens of Davidson County. Thank you. Council Lady, oh, all set. Thank Councilman Bedney. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you when we had the uh, small business caucus that you came to talk to us, and uh, you promised to work on some, some of the feedback we gave you, so I appreciate your commitment to help small businesses in the city and to come to the meeting. Uh, my question was related to the incentive that you descri described about IKEA. Yes. And I just want to make sure that that incentive also included west of uh, IKEA towards Council Member Swope, Council Lady Blaylock, and mine districts, because we get all the traffic that is going to come through our districts to go to IKEA, but we are over capacity already. So I hope that that incentive also includes doing improvements in our side of the, the store. You have raised that issue, Councilman, and just to address that with you, I should be very clear. The incentive that we're talking about is just within that immediate area. Um, I would have to talk to Public Works, but you have clearly expressed concern about the increase in traffic because of all the people who want to be shopping in Davidson County and generating two and a quarter percent sales tax for it. Davidson County, uh, <laughs> but making sure that we have appropriate transportation infrastructure so that the residents in that immediate area are not negatively affected by 
uh, that increased traffic. And Thank I will you. follow up with them on that and making sure that we're addressing that. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Hager. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Matt. I'm going back over these incentives again. And of course, you've been through my district, and I've got some areas that some buildings in a commercial area that need update. And when you get into this part about two components, fast growing small businesses and investment in blighted properties, I need a definition of the blighted. Yes. Are those the vacant buildings I've got over there? No, it's specifically limited to tier one census tracts. Uh, and, and there is a map I will email again to this council just so all the members have it. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily know where a tier one census tract is. I believe the definition of a tier one census tract is where 60% or more of the residents make 80% or less of the average wage for the area. I believe that's the definition. Regardless, we have a two-page summary of the Small Business Incentive Program that has a color-coded map that shows you where those Tier 1 census tracts are, and I will email those to this council. Okay, so if that complied with 60% less of the average wages, would those properties be eligible for these type of incentives? Yes, sir. Okay. If, 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 if the, the two requirements to be, the three requirements are that they be located in a Tier 1 census tract, right. they be worth $1 million or less, right. uh, and that you make $100,000 or more in external in, uh, improvements to the building. More than 100000 Yes, sir. Okay. And then which is this one that you got the $50,000 grant for? Th th that, that's for either of them. Essentially, when this council initially created this program, it was $1 million, half a million dollars in each bucket, uh -huh. and we didn't want more than 10 million, uh, sorry, more than 10 percent of the overall value to go to any one recipient. So let's say someone had a building that was worth $900,000, they came in and did, you know, $5 million worth of external uh -huh. improvements. <laughs> And they sucked up all half a million dollars. Well, that's not what we wanted to have happen. So we capped it at 10%. So for either of those programs, the maximum that any one business can receive is $50,000. Okay. And when you say fast-growing small business, is that somebody just coming in there with four or five people and starting a business? Or that's the, the, what's the criteria. The adding 10 people over a 12-month period that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. Any further questions? I had a quick question uh, uh, just on fact. I was asked today. Um, you may or not know the answer. Does the Nashville Entrepreneur Center receive free rent for yes. their space? They do receive uh, free rent for their it, it space. Was, yes. They, so I, I don't, this was before my time, but I am a member of the board of the EC, and I think I have these facts correct. Part of the original deal when MDHA did the redevelopment of the trolley barns was the people who were bidding, and in this case, obviously, the Matthews Company uh, won that, um, or whatever the entity is specifically. One of the contingencies was that there be free rent for the Entrepreneur Center there. Okay, so it's a long-term free rent uh, arrangement Correct. for them there. Okay, That was tied into how that would deal was originally done. And that would be separate from the uh, Entrepreneur Center uh, request that's in the... Correct. Okay. All right, thank you. Any further questions? Uh, we are running exactly on time. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, this is great. And then I see Steve Land here and from MTA. Um, and thank you for coming. <laughs> Appreciate you being here very much, both in the operating budget and in the capital spending plan. MTA has really had a historic set of increases, and it seemed uh, with the council uh, useful to refocus on making sure we're getting full value for those increases. And again, uh, I welcome your comments. Thank you. Well, um, we spoke in the general um, budget hearing about the overall approach, and I know it heard through uh, several of the prior presentations a lot of the pressing issues facing the city, and Matt touched on mobility as being one of those. So. The over sure, I'm oh, sorry. <clears throat> the overall direction we were given putting together a budget um, proposal as an outcome of the end motion strategic planning process was we have a lot of years where we haven't invested in mass transit that we have to catch up for. So it's always a balancing act of how fast do you move. And the direction was um, move as fast as you can, and then we'll we have to balance those priorities. 
So a lot of what we're doing, particularly in the operating plan, is building core services toward um, a reasonable level of service on our trunk routes. And over the past couple of years where we've seen frequency and span improvements in corridors like Murfreesboro Road, Gallatin Pike, most recently Nolansville Pike, we are seeing ridership respond to that. Um, Charlotte was most recent in the last year and that's still uh, progressing. And, um, and that's a lot of what the operational focus is this upcoming year. Um, so a lot of what we're looking at in terms of this upcoming budget, the single largest increase with respect to the operating request, about two and three quarter million goes toward a fair restructuring that essentially, historically we've had the practice of if it takes you two trips, two buses to complete your trip, you pay twice. So you pay each time you board. And under a new proposal, um, which is included in the mayor's budget, that would no longer be the case. You could change buses for free. So that accounts for, with a proportional um, reduction in passes to make sure we don't have too much migration to cash from prepaid media, that amounts to two and three quarter million dollars, which is a significant chunk of an overall $7 million increase. The other large numbers associated with the increase, two, about $2 million toward what I would call sort of the inflationary piece, fuel price adjustments, collective bargaining, um, uh, wage increases, uh, benefits, what have you. Some significant service approaches are um, that have been widely publicized, extension of the Music City Circuit uh, from downtown, which currently terminates in the north at Farmer's Market, would go up through North Nashville and into the Tennessee State University campus, turn around and come back. Also significant service improvements, predominantly in the form of frequency increases, a little bit of span increase on the 22 Bordeaux route, improvements on the 19 Herman Street bus, including an extension of that service into the nation's neighborhood, um, cooperation with the Homeless Commission on a bus pass initiative along with um, outreach efforts by the commission to the chronically homeless, and uh, a, a collaboration with Metro Planning on a travel demand management strategy. They were able to secure federal funds. Uh, travel demand management is an extensive outreach effort, particularly focused on employers to get overall reductions in single occupant auto use. So it isn't specifically mass transit, could be carpooling, could be telecommuting, um, could work at home, walk to work, bike to work. Uh, the specific focus with us, obviously, will be our Easy Ride Pass program. And then the final one is the continued um, expansion of our Access Ride program, the door-to-door -door system. And it's an expansion both in terms of demand. The system is predominantly, if not exclusively, used by senior citizens and persons with disabilities. But this year we are also uh, proposing and wanting to move forward on what we're calling a mobility on demand. Um, advancement of projects which could use access ride, could use other forms of demand responsive service like local taxis, some of the um, transportation networking companies to address issues like our first mile, last mile problem where you might live a mile away from a trunk bus route. So it's difficult for you to get to that service. Some of our cross town types of approaches and even some of our after hours types of services where the most prudent or the most fiscally conservative approach might be a, um, you know, an on-demand type service. So that highlights uh, most of, I think, the operating changes. Um, if there are any specific questions on those, or would you like me to move on to capital? Um, well, uh, a couple questions here from operating. Well, certainly, Councilman Leonardo. Uh, thanks for being here, Mr. Bland. I, I know that you. we met, and I think you met with Council Lady Hurt, too, about the, the 22, mm -hmm. uh, and you had part of your proposed budget here is to <clears throat> Uh, have stops every 15 minutes. Right? Correct. That's and, correct. And then do we know if we will be able to increase the service area of the 22 and, and do we know exactly how much uh, that we'll be able to, to fill in on Saturdays and Sundays because we obviously that's a big bus, big, it goes through several council districts. And so I didn't know if right. you had a, a, a real concrete answer on those. The, um, we are going to be able to do some weekend enhancements in frequency. The extension, I know we talked extensively because of the growth that's going up in that part of Bordeaux. 
We're still looking at it, and part of, to be frank with you, what we're looking at is would that be the nature of that development be better suited to be one, maybe one of the initial mobility on demand pilots? So I'd like to give you a more concrete answer, but it's, it's kind of a service development question where we, we're sort of, and we have about, I would say, probably eight or nine what I would call coverage requests, which are taking existing services and taking them out further. So where we want to be a little bit circumspect in just doing the standard, you know, well, let's take the 22 or let's take the 14 or let's take this route or that route because the density tends to go down is we may be looking at some more what I'll call creative options so that we accomplish both better efficiency for that piece of a service area so we're not running an empty, you know, 40-foot bus through that neighborhood, but frankly also using the more nimble models to feed those lines. So a bus that might start the end of the line empty, you know, maybe is able to start with three, four, five people that we've kind of picked up through a variety of means. And I know I've talked to a number of council people, probably no more than Councilman Swope on some of the mobility on demand issues and what might happen short term, medium term, long term. So I'm not trying to be intentionally evasive. Um, but we definitely want to work on that coverage area. But you are 100 percent certain that it's every 15 minutes on the 22 going forward. 22 uh, on the weekdays, weekday peak, 15 minute weekday peak, 20 minute evening, and then uh, 20 minute weekend. Thanks, mm -hmm. uh, Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me despite not being on the committee. Um, I will <coughs> with maybe the most difficult question. Uh, can you let? the audience know who you're intending to support in the Stanley Cup final? <laughs> uh, I have cut the cord completely. <laughs> I have lost many friends over it. Although uh, nobody has hesitated to ask me for free housing. <laughs> so I'm not sure. If Codes is coming in, I might ask them about the Airbnb if I'm not charging. It's kind of <laughs> very, very well. All right. That's, I'm glad we got that out of the way. I'll move on to uh, maybe an easier question. So I know that when you all kind of were preparing the budget request this year, right, we can think of the idea of a frequent transit network in both extended hours but also frequency. I know you all asked for just over $3 million for this fiscal year in extended service hours. And I'm just, you know, in looking at it cursorily, I'd love to understand, you know, in, in what is currently recommended, how much are we looking at in terms of, uh, you went over the routes that I think we're looking at possibly improving the headways. Are we going to get any extended service hours out of that? To be frank, um, on our fixed route system, not much in terms of extended service hours. Um, and one, I know it was an issue that came up in the mayor's budget hearing that um, that will be low productivity service. So the nature of what I'll call late night, early morning demand is there's not a huge amount of demand, but the demand that there is is really crucial demand. I mean, I get calls probably every other day. Well, the service economy, for instance, in my district in particular, right. has a lot of people that do not live in the urban core, but serve late night type of jobs and cannot use transit to access the exactly. so. so one of the early areas I mentioned, um, and in this budget, uh, with this budget proposal, we have about, apart from our general access ride increase, about $700,000 targeted toward the mobility on demand pilots. And again, one of the specific target areas, and we want to work with council on identifying this more specifically, is what I'll call the after hour or before hours market, because frankly, we get a fair number of requests for four in the morning. So ultimately, the end motion plan called for a frequent transit network about to, I think we spoke about it in the initial budget hearing, but about 14 of our 46 routes carry about 70 percent of our total ridership. So, and those are those core routes that you would think of, you know, the Nolansvilles and the Charlottes and the Gallatins. So, ultimately, in motion, the idea was to build toward a, if not a 24-hour, probably a 21 or 22-hour <laughs> network. Uh, but recognizing it's kind of a chicken and egg question. You build demand to generate the service, but provide service to address the demand. I would say the approach we're taking right now is to wade into it a little bit before we kind of jump in with both feet. 
Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Glover. Go back on the 2.3 million. I couldn't hear you exactly. Explain to me on the 2.3 million what exactly uh, what, does that cover? Was that the 2.75 million on the uh, fare change? I, it could have been. I thought okay. I heard 2.3. I couldn't. I couldn't. <clears throat> the largest of the overall increase. So the overall recommended increase in operating was $7 million right. on a base of 42, 42 and change. So the largest single piece of that is $2.75 million that will allow us to take, so right now if you were to get on a bus in um, Councilman Bedney's district, you'd pay $1.70. If you were to transfer to get off a bus in Councilman Hager's district, you'd pay another $1.70 to get on that bus. So 340 for that total trip with that, for, for lack of a better word, forced transfer. Under the proposal that's out there now, and is actually out for public comment to expedite, um, you would pay $1.70 when you get on, you'd get a free transfer slip, and you'd ride that second bus for free. Uh, so this is accounting for, and I know um, the chair asked the question about if you looked at the hardcore budget numbers, it's a significant drop in revenue as opposed to an expense. So that $2.75 million is actually to underwrite a revenue loss in that particular policy change. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Other council members? Yes, Councilman Bercher, Vice Chairman Bercher. Yes, I just want to follow up. Um, um, Councilman O'Connell was asking you with, with the allotted money, would that result in additional, uh, more frequency? And you indicated on not, the, not, um, not really. So no, how on does the, that on frequency into more ridership? Yep. On frequency, it would result in more, um, this would result in better frequency on the 22 Bordeaux, 19 Herman Street. Um, because we're essentially proposing to extend the Music City circuit up Jefferson Street to TSU, it replicates most of the existing number nine Jefferson bus. So for that part where there's overlap, and it would run at the same frequency as the current circuit, it would run at the better frequency of the current number nine Jefferson or Music City circuit. So there's additional hours to improve frequency there. Where there's uh, redundancy in service, we're reallocating, we would be reallocating the service hours from the Jefferson bus to the 19 Herman with a bit of a route extension because we've had demand. There's a couple social service agencies that have set up about half a mile past the end of that route where we're getting significant demand. And that's also a, a, a growing neighborhood uh, and would get us extra frequency there as well. So you'd see improved frequency on one, two, three, four to three routes, three existing routes. Which would result in increased ridership. Yeah, the, um, the ridership equation, probably the single biggest contributor to increased ridership out of this entire proposal would be that fair recommendation. Not frequency. Uh, frequency should help. The, the challenge is when you're looking at individual riders, you're always, there's always the weakest link in the chain. And what people will look at is overall convenience, which are things like frequency. It's how easy is it to get to a bus stop. It's what's it like to wait for a bus. And certainly um, the number of shelters we've installed over the last two years has been significant to help in that regard. It's speed of service, so and it tends to be the weakest link. So it could be super easy for me to get to a bus. It could be a great shelter I'm waiting at. It could be a very direct route, but if it only runs two hours, uh, every two hours, I'm not going to use it. So that's what we look at. And um, where we're targeting that extra frequency is where you've got a combination of market demand, so looking at the demographics of a particular ridership area, or trip generators, for instance, I mentioned with the Herman bus, we have a couple significant um, locations that are generating transit trips that are just past the end of the route, and these are the kinds of things that Councilman Leonardo uh, and we have been talking about. Um, and also, we know from existing service, so for instance, the Bordeaux route right now, 
as we've added services to Murfreesboro, Gallatin, Nolansville, Charlotte over the years, ridership on those routes has gone up, but what we measure as service productivity has gone down a little bit, meaning that you're getting more ridership, but because you put out more service, each hour of service is carrying a little, a little less. That means other routes are kind of jumping up the productivity chart. And right now, Bordeaux is significantly the one with the highest level of ridership per hour and the one that warrants, for lack of a better word, that increased service level, that better frequency. I hope that was relatively legible. Yeah, you answer. I, I, what I suspected, you answered. Thank you. I don't, I don't have a question. I'd just like to make a comment. And I want to thank you for extending that route at Tennessee State to get the students closer to the dorms. I appreciate your um, uh, efficiency and your uh, timely response to my request. Thank you. Next question. So did you want to move on to a capital comment? Uh, the, whatever the committee would like to do. That, that would be appropriate. Thanks. Um, very quickly, the capital spending memo, there were for Metro Transit Authority, there were five particular um, projects identified. The largest, the significantly the largest, is standard replacements and upgrades to our fleet of buses and access ride vans. Uh, right now we have a fleet of about 285, 280, 285 buses and access ride vans and they have varying useful lives. So we have a fleet acquisition strategy and our target is always to replace a bus at or near the end of its useful life and to try to balance those replacement cycles so that we, we don't end up with every bus in the fleet new at one time, every bus in the fleet almost ready to be retired at one time. So $17.5 million dollars um, will allow us to replace, it's on the order of magnitude, about 30 some of our standard transit coaches and about a dozen of the access ride vans um, this year, which would be a significant improvement in the operational characteristics of the fleet. Some of the elements with um, fleet replacement, a, a, a beyond what you would expect. You know, every, we all eventually get rid of our old car, buy a new car, and it's nice, and it has all the newest features. Uh, but significantly lower operating <laughs> expense in terms of maintenance. Um, now, the fixed route buses we're buying are hybrid electric diesel technology, so we see about a 30 to 40 percent improvement in fuel economy. So the money we spend on the capital portion of the budget does translate into operating budget savings down the road. You know, and, and I think very important, at least the feedback we've gotten from customers and the general public is, they're also significantly lower pollution, <coughs> lower emission. And really any new bus, even if it's a straight diesel bus, is going to have significantly lower emission than the bus it replaces. But then when we add the hybrid electric technology to that, um, it goes down even further. Beyond that, the newest technology, and this would be the first round where we're getting this, actually has the ability for us to geofence certain locations in our system. So for instance, with all the work we do with Metro Schools, we can geofence schools, we can geofence our Music City Central, where the bus is essentially not allowed to run on diesel in those isolated locations, that it will always run on battery to further reduce what I would call spot emissions in those zones. So that's the, the number one or the largest um, piece. The second item is what's referred to as grant match. We have access to state and federal and occasionally other sources of outside funding for different purposes. They generally have very favorable leverage ratios. Kind of our standard is for every dollar we can get from Metro, we can generate $9 in state and federal investment. And that goes toward every, for instance, one of the projects we have planned this upcoming year is um, Music City Central will be um, having its 10 year anniversary. And it is, that is a heavily used building. So we're planning about a $10 million rehabilitation of that facility to both systems 
and to physical appearance, painting, you know, those types of things. So that tends to, those grants tend to fund what I would call our general infrastructure, IT investments, shop equipment, the things that we need to run the system. <laughs> the um, third item, fare collection system, um, we covered a fair amount both in last year's budget where we'd gotten kind of the startup funding in this year's budget which would complete the financing package. Apart from replacing an old and antiquated system that's becoming increasingly unreliable, it will also allow us to upgrade to much simpler and modern payment strategies like general smart cards. Right now we have limited smart card use. For instance, Metro Nashville Public Schools has a smart card based ID system that we use with a stride program. Um, Metro employees have access to a smart card. This would allow us to actually market a general use smart card on an account based system to make that payment much simpler. It would also enable us to move toward mobile payment and that's probably now that we have real time information available the number one thing I hear in terms of a passenger convenience request. Um, so that's the fare collection system. TSU circulator identified at one point million dollars through the motion process, and I know I've talked to a number of council people about this, one of the improvements over time we're targeting are a series of probably in the order of 20 to 25 neighborhood, tran neighborhood mobility hubs on the what I'll call the outer ends of our system. And these would be places where multiple bus routes come together, but would also be places where you could have B-cycle, transportation network companies, car share, um, you know, you name it as sort of a mobility attraction. Um, hopefully, potentially partnering with other metro entities like schools or libraries or parks to have them in coordination with other neighborhoods. So this one would be in conjunction with the extension of the circuit up to TSU to essentially start uh, the work on one of those centers and we have been working with the university to identify um, property toward that end. The engineering studies piece, the fourth, uh, or I'm sorry, the fifth item in that agenda, $4 million. Uh, Mayor Barry has been very clear in her intent to move forward with a dedicated funding referendum next year and a lot of what's being, a lot of what this would this work up front would be looking at those high capacity corridors. The corridors identified in end motion for potential light rail and high end bus rapid transit improvements to do the advanced work, not full design. I don't want to give you the impression that we would have a completely designed light rail system, but the front end work um, on those feasibility studies and environmental, you know, that would allow us to give Metro Council. Um, the state and the voters kind of a full picture, uh, a more complete picture of what would be involved in those types of projects. Thank you. Um, questions for the council? Councilman O'Connell. Sure. Steve, I really appreciate you going through this on this additional work session here. Um, and I think, again, looking through the process of what in motion recommended, what's possible now, you had initially requested in a under capital budget for FY18, uh, $5 million for transit priority corridor through downtown to connect neighborhood services. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that is not here in terms of what is going to spend Correct. Under what you Correct. Identify. Yeah. The status of that, um, we've been working very closely. That project's actually under the leadership of Public Works. Frankly, as the corridor projects are, because when we talk about lessons learned from the AMP and, and motion other experiences, projects of that magnitude, whether it be the downtown alignment or it's the high capacity corridors, are really as much right of way and public, you know, it's as much of an impact on traffic and sidewalks and signals and all the things that Public Works has purview over. So we've established kind of a working group to do that cooperatively. And in terms of the downtown piece, because as we said in In Motion, but we have all these great corridor plans that lead into a gray box and we kind of throw up our hands and say, what do we do with a gray box? Um, Public Works is working very aggressively right now in data collection to say, well, okay, what are our options, uh, particularly during a week like this, um, you know, to expedite or improve the flow of traffic and transit, not just to, but through downtown Nashville. Because what we found in motion, a lot of the folks who were asking for for example, crosstown service 
very often the quickest way would be if we could improve the flow of traffic and transit through downtown you know the easiest way might very well be to go through and not across or around downtown well and again i mean coming back to what i see in the plan right it's like we had an initial request that would have initiated crosstown routes on nine corridors that's not in the spending plan and i would just worry a little bit with public works having a high level breakdown of paving sidewalks and bikeways i don't see the downtown piece necessarily called out in that so yeah. i just want to make sure that especially with this week being the week we're having this discussion right. that we start to move on that soon rather than well i think this is definitely a year um and what i would say is there, there's likely I, I can't say that it's this with 100 percent certainty there's likelihood that some of that four million dollar number would apply to downtown as we're looking at overall corridors because as i like to say if you're if you're familiar with the end motion map of the high capacity corridors we have you know gallatin and nolensville and murfreesboro it's not just about saying how does that corridor get back and forth to downtown it's how does it go through downtown and out the other end and continue so that conceivably you would get on train bus whatever it is on gallatin road and if your ultimate destination were on nolensville you would stay on that vehicle and go through um, so that's an important part. And the reflection of not having anything specifically on that, Councilman, is the idea that this is a year where a lot of this piece, you know, we've, we've already got most, if not just about all of the front end work on what I'll call service and technology work done for in motion, where it's essentially as resources are available, we can start to deploy. But on what I'll call the heavy infrastructure, whether it's light rail, bus rapid transit, commuter rail, rapid bus there's still an awful lot of environmental public engagement planning and design so the idea is we can advance on the downtown segment conceptual design data collection work but there's not an expectation in the upcoming fiscal year that there would be hard design or construction on an improvement just yet thank you council council lady johnson with nashville village being amongst the high capacity corridors I want, again, 29 amended in to the nine quarters that are listed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Mendez. I was going to uh, ask about the gray box you mentioned. And and you, you might answer that. I was having a hard time hearing. Um, w when uh, do you anticipate that there will be a plan that's ready for prime time and public discussion for how the Galton corridor train would get across the river and interact with downtown? Well, it probably depends on your definition of high, you know, like down to the inch or parcel. We're still a ways off and environmental, but conceptually to say, you know, okay, here's, you know, we're, that's the intent of these funds is to get enough meat on the bones where people kind of have an understanding of what that general approach okay it's generally here it might not be down to here's a station right at this intersection but an idea of here's how far it will go here's the general alignment as you say here how does it cross the river um here's how many stations here's sort of a a, a picture of service level uh, to that uh, do you have a sense of whether that level of granularity that you just described will be um available prior to referendum um yeah i can't speak specifically to exactly how much but actually the improve act is fairly fairly specific in you've got to give people essentially enough information to know what they're voting on so it's not oh it might be you know this street it might be that street there's got to be a fair enough level of detail that you've got to now frankly with it being new and we've been back and forth and we'll continue to be back and forth with the state on okay how much level so we can target design work to that but it won't be so coming back to downtown it won't, well here's a big gray box it'll be somewhere in there it would be certainly much more specific than that both in terms of scope cost and schedule and uh 
I mean, obviously it's not ready to be discussed publicly, otherwise you'd tell us. Yeah. Um, but I mean, is-, is I would it, tell you if I knew. Is there an idea or is there several ideas that are being discussed north of downtown, south of downtown? Um, well, I mean, you know, the obvious starting point when you th when we think of the high capacity corridors is always, so why would you deviate from the current bus route? So I think if you kind of took, for instance, with Gallatin Road, the alignment of the 26 and 56, maybe not all the way out is f to that to that end, but say, well, okay, here's here's how they run now. Now, what's wrong with that if you upgrade, you know, if you were to upgrade that facility? So. I don't think if, you know, whether you're a council or frankly an engine, not, I'm not an engineer, but the engineers we work with, you know, as a starting point in a corridor, you would look at other alternatives, particularly if you found um, fatal flaws in that part of the alignment, but that's not a bad place to start. Because again, when the old trolley, largely our bus routes follow the old trolley lines and they ran them out there for a reason, so. Um, well, you, you'll be happy to know I just used your app to find out that the 56 cross is on the uh, James Robertson Bridge. Yes, and I'm sorry, I would have been happy to tell you that, because uh, <laughs> that one's easy to prove or disprove. All right, uh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? All right, if not, Thank you very much for being here, and we will move on to Thank you all very much. Weekly, um, and the National General Hospital. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, Good afternoon. I also have with me um, Bill, who's coming to the table, Bill Latham, who's the controller for the hospital. Great. Thank you very much. Um, all of us heard Tuesday night quite a lot uh, testimony about the hospital, and so um, thank you for being here, having this quick follow-up. We'll try to keep it focused. Uh, you all made very clear in your original budget hearings, uh, of course, that $35 million is not uh, a number that you were comfortable with going forward, and I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about the additional funding that you feel that you would need. Now, specifically, there is a, and I'm looking over here at Councilman Mendez, he's the sponsor of this wish list item of $5 million um, of additional funding in the operating budget. And if you would just speak to the efficacy of that $5 million. Certainly. Um, framing up the current year budget um, as proposed originally in the amount of $55.7 million. Um, I came into the organization without history of, of the um, original budget that was provided in um, the prior year. Um, I, I did have a little bit of history of National General Hospital early in my career, and I was charged with what does it take to run the hospital, and I looked at many components as I mentioned before. I looked at the hospital as compared to standards. I looked at where their staffing was compared to what a hospital should be staffed at. Um, we found areas that where they were understaffed. Um, we also found areas where significant cuts had directly resulted in their inability to operate appropriately as a hospital. So that's how you arrive at the 55.7. There was details that was sent out that basically line items that it's continued operations and it allows for um, very small increases in terms of raises, um, very small incremental things such as a, 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 le a operating um, expense for a budgeting software for the hospital to actually have a budgeting system because right now it's in Excel. So I, I know we talked about that a little bit earlier and that that's an inappropriate system to be trying to budget a hospital in. So that's how you arrived at 55.7. It's, it's basically in continuing operations and then there's a list of small items that are added to that. In terms of uh, additional five on top of the 35, what it would end up with would be re a reduction in the amount of cuts that would have to be made. When we looked at $35 million, I looked back all the way going to, I think, 2008, and the hospital's not operated on $35 million and in that 10-year period back. There's been supplemental um, dollars or there's been a row forward of debt for the hospital. So what would it buy? It wouldn't buy anything additional. It would just 
extend the life of the hospital's current operations or it would reduce the amount of cuts the hospital would have to make. And then if you'd spend a moment just talking about capital spending, you're not in the current capital spending plan and what would be the um, sort of minimum request the hospital might have in that regard. Okay. And did I fully answer, was there a question about um, the, the $35 million and, and the length of time that would, um, would also, um, the hospital could manage on the $35 million through the end of November. The additional $5 million would allow the hospital to manage um, operations um, approximately till the beginning of January. However, that is not, not the way that the hospital would have to go. They would have to put in cuts in order to make the, the dollars last throughout the year. Um, so did I clearly answer that? I know you, that was a question that you had. I'm, I'm sorry, I got distracted. I was, I was listening. Uh, I mean, that's when I when I proposed five million. Um, I, I I intended exactly what you just said that it would put off um, the date to ask for a supplemental for a couple of months. Correct. And the only other alternative that makes sense is that if the hospital authority chooses to actually try to do a year for $35 million, I assume there will be substantial radical cuts to make that happen. That is correct. Service lines would be uh, reduced or eliminated in order to make $35 million. And work. just to put a fine point on it for people who might be watching on TV, when, you, when we talk about service lines would be eliminated, we're talking about things like... At this time, I would not um, say which specific service lines would be eliminated. That would be up to the board. They would have to look at the alternatives in terms of operating and how to how to provide the best care possible with 35 million. Let me ask it this way: um, What are the um, uh, most costly? And when I say most costly, in terms of um, biggest loss leader product lines, service lines. Um, you have. Areas such as uh, women's services, obstetric services, um, certain outpatient services. The hospital has a um, payer mix of 40% of charity and uninsured, so that would take a dramatic toll on patient services for, for those patients. And, and so if the hospital authority were looking to do the year for $35 million, they were looking to reduce service lines, presumably they would go to the ones that created the most losses. And um, if you follow that logic, that would be women's services and these outpatient services you're referring to? Yes, they would, they would most likely be impacted, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Council Governor. Uh, Talia. And uh, finance department. When we did these supplemental uh, revenues for the hospital over the last couple of years, where's that money come from? What, what, where, did, where did we draw that money out of? Uh, that money came out of uh, our general fund balance. Okay. So he, here's the thing that concerns me is if we already know that you're going to be asking for additional money going into the year, and you've sat here and told us that you can't do it. Right now, things are good when things take a turn, and the economy always does that. If we get in this type of habit, how do we keep up this type of funding? Uh, so I, 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 just, I don't know. I think, I think some hard decisions are going to have to be made, or either we need to sit down and, Chair, I think we're going to have to say, okay, we need to budget X number of dollars for it, because when we don't have it and you need it, uh, I mean, the thing that scares me the most is when you guys came to us and we said, well, look, what if we put this off for a few weeks? Well, if you put it off for a few weeks, we can't make payroll in two weeks. That was unacceptable to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I don't want to get to that critical stage again. I don't know how we do that, but Chair, I certainly think we'd like to have, I'd like to have a deeper conversation about that. We're well, reading through your question, if I'm not mistaken. You're basically saying you're going to not make payroll in November. At, at the 35. Correct. Uh, at the current funding level. Right. So we've got five months. Correct. Okay. Or, or, or the hospital authority is going to have to do something radical to if they take us seriously about our budget number. If they, yeah. thank you, Councilman. Councilman Lady Wiener. This is actually a question for John Cooper. So wake up back there. So my question would be this: um, What are we obligated to provide in terms of hospital care by state law? 
not obligated to provide any hospital for hospital. What are we obligated to provide in a safety net hospital? I don't know that there is, there is no state law definition that I know of of a safety net hospital and what specific services that have to be provided. Okay, let's take it one step further. What local obligations do we have, whether it's charter or ordinance, where we're required to have this? The charter had a hospital board um, back when the hospital was over on the other side when it was general over there. Um, when the Hospital Authority Act was created and Metro officially um, opted in or, or adopted the Hospital Authority, those charter provisions really became uh, meaningless at that point. So I mean, right now the Hospital Authority is a, a creature of, se of state law, a separate legal entity so I guess my last follow-up question bluntly are we required to have a safety net hospital legally no that was all I wanted uh, Councilman Leonardo I, I want to say that I was actually at Metro General today went to the walk-in clinic had a great experience you know um, but the other my main question when I look through these photographs I mean and I think Councilman Pulley can appreciate this. I mean, it, it says plaintiff's lawyer all over. I mean, these look like liabilities. And so what's it going to take to correct these things so that we don't, you know, find ourselves potentially sued over silly things and not so silly things? And what's it going to take to correct these pictures? How much? Um, the hospital has uh, identified capital needs. Because that's what those stem from, or capital equipment needs of $21.7 million that obviously cannot be funded in a single year. However, the hospital does need to get on a, a replacement plan. So the request this year was approximately $4 million for uh, equipment and infrastructure. And so are we using some of this faulty equipment, like these wheelchairs that are cracked? I mean, is that just, is this stuff retired or is it still in use? Some of those items are still in use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the computer system that the, that the nurses use that has the cracked wire, um, that is absolutely still in use. So we were, I, I know Councilman Foley has questions. We're on the yeah. table. Yes. You know, not, not at all. Okay. That's why we're here. Thanks for coming. Nice to see you again. Hey. Um, as a council member, we're asked to weigh in on a lot of things, and uh, one of which is a hospital with which I have no expertise whatsoever. So we uh, try to study and work as hard as we can to understand this. And then this is a very difficult picture for me to see because we seem to be getting mixed uh, mixed figures from uh, different people. So I've done my best to drill down on this, and I want to help get you and give you an opportunity to help me here uh, answer a couple of questions. Um, I'm, is, I'd like to revisit a couple of things after what I heard at the public hearing. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm looking back at these numbers, and I don't really see anywhere where uh, in, in normal operating expenses, I can't find a $50 million supplement anywhere. I know you got ultimately $50 million and 500000 last year, but $16 million of that was a uh, supplement that really dealt with one-time expenditures. I wouldn't necessarily consider those normal operating expenditures, would you? In, in terms of the, re the resulting request for $16 million and I think prior year's request mm -hmm. of $10 million, what I've been able to ascertain was in actuality, some of it was operating, routine operating, so it resulted in bills that were unpaid. So if you look at the, the shortfall in subsidy funds year over year, what you end up with is a, a buildup of unpaid payables. And you begin to the, get to the point where it's pay a vendor or pay an employee. We try to always make sure that you can pay the employees, but you also have to make sure that the vendor can deliver the blood and the pharmaceutical drugs that are needed. And so those choices are made on a daily basis. So shortfalls um, have been an, an ongoing and roll forward, and it's been managed on through their payables or lack thereof. So these are shortfalls, but I don't see where we've given you $50 million. I see where you've carried them over based on the numbers. Um, so 
what I'd like to get is revisit uh, uh, this letter that came from Dr. Brandis, and uh, particularly, I'm sure you're familiar with that letter, are you not? I, I have. I've reviewed that. Okay. And I just want to get at a couple of things because I want to be responsible and know just exactly what we're walking into when we look into the future because I have a couple of concerns moving forward. Uh, I do want to go in eyes wide open with what we're looking at. So. Uh, uh, it says uh, five bullet points, and in there you say we are, uh, she says, uh, we are focused on overcoming these challenges, uh, reducing supply costs, reducing labor costs, uh, negotiating with suppliers, on and on and on. And I just wanted to ask if, uh, if, if y'all are really committed to reducing those and addressing those bullet points. Uh, and if so, can you give us an idea over the last five months of what's been done to address them? Certainly. So we've also provided a response to that to Metro Finance, and we're actively work with Metro, Metro Finance almost on a weekly basis. Cash updates, cash flows are provided, um, updates are provided in addition to updates to that. Um, in terms of things that have been happening, things that have been changing, things that are being done, one of the things I did was assess what's caused some of it. What's caused the inability to collect the accounts receivable when services are performed? Why was it not collected? Then I looked at, then I took a look at the infrastructure, and the years that have gone by with underfunding has made National General Hospital make some poor decisions. And unfortunately, it wasn't a matter of mismanagement. Um, people who didn't necessarily know what they were doing. It's just hard choices that have been made at that hospital every year. In terms of accounts receivable, I looked at the infrastructure and one of the first things I did was propose to the board a new structure for the revenue cycle because components of it had been completely dismantled. You had missing pieces that basically made you unable to properly perform the tasks necessary in order to run the revenue through that and collect it. Those have been corrected. Additionally, um, there is more work being done to try to collect anything that's out there. Um, there is a company that they work with uh, that they did outsource and save um, several million dollars on um, by outsourcing their back end revenue cycle piece. So they, uh, a good point there for cost savings. However, you have to give your back end service uh, a good quality product to start with. So several things have contributed to poor information going into that. Current IT system is insufficient. And I say IT meaning not hardware, things like that, although that is in the capital. But it's things such as what the physician has to use for documentation, what the nurses has to use. That stemmed from being unable to maintain the system they previously had. Therefore, what they had to do because they didn't have operating cash in order to keep up with the updates of their system, they then had to go and ask for capital to buy a new one. So those are choices that get made that impact their ability to properly operate. And then when there's not enough funding, which positions do you not fill? And choices have been made that as, as you continue down the path of having insufficient money, you also continue down the path of operating an inefficient hospital. In terms of, of other things, supplier contracts, the hospital's under a GPO plan. They do try to leverage that. They don't do independent contracts for pens, pencils, copiers, things like that. They're, they do um, participate in a group purchasing plan. So there's always, in every hospital, there's always supply opportunity. That's actually been built into the fiscal year 18 budget. There was um, supply cost savings built into that. However, their fiscal year 17 budget and at the current $35 million 18 budget will not account for the known increases in pharmaceutical costs. Pharmaceutical costs went up significantly this um, in the current fiscal year. There's not a budget for that. So you're, you're in a situation where you have to supply that medication to a patient. And when you do that, you may or may not have the money to pay the vendor. However, you have a patient in your hospital, you have to take care of them. So they are committed to making changes. However, they're committed to making smart changes. We've spent a qu uh, quite a bit of time in educating and ensuring that when you make a decision to not fill a position or not to upgrade a system, that you understand the long-term impact. And, and I would think that... <laughs> And I would think that that would be something that you might want to get periodic updates on. How are we doing? What are we doing in terms of it, once you get to the ultimate number, how are we managing to that number? 
To that end, I, I do want to ask you about the six million dollars in uncollectible old accounts receivable that uh, was in the sixty million dollar supplement we had last year, and that was from untimely filings. The majority of that, uh, you and I have discussed that issue. Have we? reached out to try to collect any of that even though it was untimely and if so how are we doing in that area and uh, along that same lines have we fixed that problem altogether are we now not having any untimely filings or do we need these positions in order to make that happen um several questions there They're we all, are still having timely filing answer them all at one time <laughs> so i'm gonna let you give it a crack all right so we um we do still have timely filing issues you have accounts receivable that's aged over the timely filing period so you still have what i would consider questionable accounts receivable out there meaning it's plagued with it's hitting an edit it doesn't have enough documentation it didn't um didn't make it through their their system appropriately um documentation wasn't attached due to the system that they use. There's still lots of opportunity. There's enormous opportunity in the revenue cycle. There have been two positions added to that in order to start the process. Currently with that, what is happening is a shadowing of all of the account um, accounts receivable process from the beginning to the end to identify the weaknesses and where you can potentially end up with having an issue in terms of an edit, something not hitting the, and going to the payer and getting paid timely. So all of those are what I consider under observation. There also will be forthcoming an action plan related to that. So in terms of staffing needs associated with that, they were woefully understaffed. Two positions just not um, shore that up. It is a start and is an assessment is underway there. Um, Paralon has worked diligently with National General Hospital in order to work with payers that actually had filing uh, timely filing limits and some of that has been recouped. The last estimate, I do not know the whole dollars, but I know it has been in excess of $2 million. Additionally, what I will say is that that occurred during a period of time in which you had no revenue cycle management. So those positions were vacant in the hospital. And so you had no in-house revenue cycle oversight. It also occurred during a time in which they changed their system from the, the robust system that they had to a downgraded system and that in itself created issues with bills being able to get out so you had two you have basically had a, a, a two-prong impact to your, your revenue cycle and it impacted your uh, ability to collect additionally um, that has improved I showed some graphics on how the timely filing has come down however there is some AR out there that still has to be worked there's still uh, assessments to be done on what um, what else needs to be done in the revenue cycle however my advice was let's assess fully first before we just throw bodies at it and so you are currently assessing that to see how many bodies you need to throw at it is that the strategy when I say throw bodies at it, what I mean is you're woefully understaffed in that area. I think that um, 2016, the focus in 2017, the focus was on stabilizing clinically your, your hospital. When I looked at the staffing metrics that um, were occurring during 2015, 2016, you were by no means at the standard that most hospitals run at. So there's a standard of um, staffing in your in your patient care areas there's also a standard of the support that is needed to um, run a hospital so step one that the hospital took from what i can tell was to stabilize your clinical site to avoid any additional sentinel, sentinel events to avoid any particular um, closures by joint commission to ensure that you could pass joint commission joint commission you know basically tells the world that you're a safe environment to to seek care in so i think step one was to shore up that side step two now has been let's restore the financial areas of the hospital to ensure that when that patient is seen one it can be properly accounted for there was also issues with your audit it can be properly accounted for it can be properly billed and collected all of that has to work in tandem so now you're in phase two so i would consider your hospital in a, a rebuild phase all right, i have only one other and then i'll pass the torch to all the rest of you with questions but um, I know it's very difficult to annualize accurately nine months of data, 
uh, which we have year to date through March 2017. But when, when you do annualize that and compare it, uh, there's a couple of trends here that are a little bit concerning. Um, ER visits down 13%, uh, inpatient surgeries are down 23%, outpatient surgeries down 10% in making that comparison. And those are a couple of the highlights, uh, which uh, kind of leads me concerned about underutilized uh, um, suites uh, in, the op in, in the hospital for these kinds of things. Um, does this concern you moving forward about uh, uh, producing revenue, considering the amount of, uh, amount of services that we provide where we don't uh, garner revenue? Uh, in, in terms of making this a, somewhat of a sustaining hospital, even with the amount of money that we give you to, as a supplemental thing. So the emergency room is what I consider almost a front door of the hospital. That's where you see the majority of your patients. It's a very busy emergency room. However, there's been, uh, however, it's the most expensive area to receive your care in. They staff 24-7 physicians and nurses, radiology, basically have to have on hand everything possible. So you have to respond to your volume. There has been a concerted effort to educate the public about alternatives. If you do not need a true emergency room, if you do not need the standard for true emergency care, please try to seek services in one of the lower cost settings. It's lower cost for the patient, lower cost for the hospital. So what you see is a decrease in the emergency room visits, but you're also seeing an increase in clinic visits. So the last three months have been trending up in the, the clinic visits and they are on track to to be at um, the to be at or above last year's levels hence the inaccuracy of nine months of data <laughs> <laughs> well it, it, it does give you an indicator however I will say the early months in the clinic trends were lower and now the month over month over month they're seeing progressively increased volumes in terms of the OR and utilization there, I do think that it, it does lend itself to the inability to recruit additional surgeons due to the inability to cash flow that. Um, physicians do, don't come cheap. They, they have a, a um, you know, a, a service line that has to be supported. They have to be supported it's in the capital budget. They have to be supported with equipment. They have to be supported with staff. And we simply do not have the dollars to make the investment that will ultimately increase volume. You do have what you consider underutilized services, but then you adjust your staffing down to that. We use a productivity system that flex the staffing based upon volumes. That was newly installed this year. So yes, I would love to see a, a more vibrant, more um, a robust volume going through the operating room. I think that there's um, quality services that are provided there. However, that also requires an investment in physicians and in equipment in order to do that. So you certainly don't want to be scheduling services that you can't accommodate. I would be, uh, I'm sure we all would uh, moving forward, interested in monitoring the progress of uh, what kind of things you are doing to increase these services and to get the word out there. Uh, so that these revenues could uh, be increased and, and not put us in this position. Um, so I don't have anything further other than uh, uh, is is there any uh, does the administration care to comment on any of these answers or just in fairness? No. So, I would just say that um, in terms of the subsidy, I would like to comment that. Um, we have provided information to this council in terms of what that subsidy has been uh, over the years, and it has not been a $50 million number. It has been a um, somewhere between, I think the, the lowest point was like in the 20s, some odd million, up to uh, $35 million. But uh, if you look at the actual data, and the actual data comes from um, CAFRs, and we know what those are, audit reports. Those audit reports reflect the actual transfers that have been made to the hospital authority. So we um, would respectfully disagree that the number has been 50 million uh, in terms of uh, what the uh, uh, ongoing costs have been. Um, I would also um, add that we did include, uh, in terms of capital, that we did include uh, some funding for the hospital last year. We asked the hospital to prioritize um, uh, how that funding would be spent. 
So, and, and the things that we were told of the highest priority at that time were mostly technology related projects in the hospital and not necessarily perhaps tying back to some of the items that you might see in these materials being presented in terms of a need around wheelchairs and things of that nature. Um, uh, and also in terms of um, capital, we're not done yet. There are lots of there are lots of capital requests that did not make it this first round uh, in terms of what has been presented to uh, to the council for this year and um, hospital authority as well as many many other departments and many other many other needs have been identified. They're still on the table for consideration for capital. Uh, spending later this fiscal year should we see that uh, adequate revenues are there. Well, Ms. Peekley, I appreciate you coming. You have, you've got a tough job and you've stepped into one here and I uh, appreciate you coming and, and giving us these answers and doing the job you're doing. I found that uh, my interaction has been wonderful over at the hospital and you have great staff, so thank you. Thank you, Councilman. I know Councilman Bednay had raised hand. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to remind us all that, uh, that we have a national issue that is impacting healthcare in Nashville, which is the lack of expansion in the state. And the president just submitted a new budget that is, uh, if applying full is going to cut many of the money we get <coughs> that comes through the state as pass through or comes directly from the federal government. So we, this budget that we are dealing with, it's probably the last one before, if the Congress decides to enact the cuts that the President have, that we have to really be mindful that we are going to face a dramatically different landscape next year. Uh, so I wanted to follow up on the comment that uh, Council Lady Winner made about um, the safety net. And I would like to say that we do morally uh, need to have a safety net in Nashville mostly because uh, we have so many people uninsured and uninsurable that are unable to get healthcare services in any other places. And so if we, as a city, we are concerned about the people that are being left behind because of our growth, uh, healthcare is one of the things that impact people the most when they have to deal with housing issues. And, and so I think that uh, although it's, uh, it is a lot of money, we're talking about the life and health care of thousands of Nashville residents, which I know we all care about, including the mayor's office. It's been very supportive. So I, I just want you guys not to lose perspective, if you don't mind me preaching to you, that we're talking about people's lives uh, that are at risk. So I just want to say that. Thank you, Councilman. Council Lady Bircher. Yeah, so um, just going back through the packet for projected revenues to $42.1 million. And then also looking at the, the marketing plan of that, that projected revenue, what the, can, you, can you provide an amount that the marketing plan is, is attributing to that? That's my <coughs> first question. My second question, I don't recall, what was the amount you were, you were paying Singenthaler for, for that, to do your marketing? Um, the, the amount that is in the budget is a, a small amount for marketing. It, is, it woefully um, is insufficient to properly market your hospital. I will start with that. It's $850,000. So if you're really going to move the needle on exposing the hospital to a different payer mix, exposing the hospital to uh, additional volume, there it would require a, a significantly larger investment. That in itself is education of services that are existing at the hospital. It doesn't really provide for any expansion of new services. It educates on what we have in an attempt to reach out to the public beyond what's currently just around us to educate on where we've translated the, the increase in volume is in the clinics. Um, the, the increase in volume that is um, built into the budget is a result of the new hospitalist program and the new ER contract that we have that provides for a better handoff between the emergency room and inpatient, so therefore we're not deferring patients out if you can't find a physician to accept them. So that problem has been solved. Um, so those two slight increases in revenue are built in as a result uh, of those two components. What were your revenues last year without the marketing plan? 
um, a, right oh, okay. at around 40 million, I believe. So, um, just doing in say. net revenue, not gross revenue. So, so understand that National General Hospital overall gets 17.2 cents on the dollar. So there's a lot of energy and effort going in, and then there's not a lot of dollars that come out. So it takes a lot of energy and effort, and you have to push a lot out in order to see basically the needle move on, on the net revenue. So there's anticipated a little over a million dollar growth in net revenue. That is a conservative number. However, that will only be achievable with investment. That number can grow significantly with further investment. Physician services is an, is an area of that, that if you make the investment in physician services to grow volume, you're not going to see the same year payback. They typically are on a ramp up, such as National Health Clinic is on the ramp up. You start up a clinic, there are expenses on the front end, and ultimately over time, you do expect to pay over, pay back over that. You will not get it first year. However, if you don't begin plans such as that, you'll never grow your volumes. So the full 850000 has that already been spent? It has not. It is budgeted and is also on um, the, the chopping block if, if the budget is not funded. And that is of great concern to me because it also leaves the board members unable to meet one of their obligations, which is appropriately market the hospital. That was one of their commitments that they made. However, without additional funding, they can't meet that commitment because there will not be dollars for marketing because dollars will be a matter of how many patients can we serve with $35 million. So in the priority of things, marketing is where? In, in that priority? Unfortunately, it would be in the very large, in the large in, scheme of things. Um, in the fifty-five point seven million dollars, the eight fifty is not enough to move uh, a, a great deal of volume. I would love to see additional dollars put in the marketing plan because I think more people need to be aware of the services that are available at Nashville General Hospital. And again, I think t uh, years year over year, when when they look at places to cut, they look at support services, they, just, they look at marketing services, and how do you cut those things that don't affect the patient at, in the bed? And, and those are the ones that get cut first. So considering the state of the hospital, you're saying that $850,000 is well spent? It is very well spent. However, not at the expense of, of, of providing medication at the bedside. So that is why it would be one of those areas of elimination. However, yes, it is certainly well spent, well invested, and um, certainly <coughs> Uh, does not meet the need in order to educate and to potentially grow volumes for the hospital. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Councilman Bendis. Uh, hopefully, uh, three relatively quick questions. Um, for uh, what, what do you anticipate at the end of the fiscal year the accounts payable number will be? Um, in terms of those that are aged accounts payable, we've been aggressively working on that. Um, we've been submitting weekly to Metro Finance the plan on this is where accounts payable is. This is um, the dollars that we're trying to put towards that. So we are looking at that being under $5 million. So it will be one of the best years in terms of roll forward aged accounts payable. And I qualify aged accounts payable as vendors that are no, over 90 days old. Some of the contracts really are 45 or 30 days. So it doesn't account for those vendors, but in terms of where the hospital has been for carrying over 14 million plus, they've made a significant amount of progress in that. However, come July 1, in order to stave off as much time as possible, that will probably reverse itself. You will probably see a significant climb in accounts payable once again, because that's <coughs> how Nashville General has had to manage the um, shortfall of revenue, shortfall uh, of available cash. Um, all right, question number two is, um, there were, were some questions about uh, um, uh, litigation and you mentioned the Joint Commission. I just wanna make sure we're real clear. I'm assuming you don't have any reason to believe that the standard of care isn't being provided at the hospital, right? That is correct. The standard of care, which is one of the, mo the first areas of focus that I saw come into play in 2016, I think 2015, under the, the leadership of the new CEO, there was the, was the main focus, uh, a center uh, of excellence for patient care, and also an attempt to drive down costs. 
meaning build your outpatient areas to give alternatives such as what's being happening in the emergency room, educate on what are the alternatives so you can over time reduce your costs. Hospitals are seeing, you know, the, that they're having to make those choices and the investment in the outpatient world in order to try to get preventive medicine out to them to try to avoid chronic inpatient stays that are very costly. And it's also very difficult on the patients in terms of quality of patient care. You really should be focusing on prevention, not waiting for someone to walk into your emergency room and then have to be admitted. All right, thank you. And then the third question is for Legal Director <coughs> Cooper. Um, and, and I do want to follow up on, I think, a question that uh, Council Lady Wiener was asking earlier. The, um, I, I started thumbing through the charter while this was going on, and, um, and there's a charter provision about um, providing hospitals. Um, is, I think that is a, um, a power that the government has. Um, I don't believe it's an obligation. I don't, I don't recall there being language in there saying that the government shall provide well, I, I'll just uh, reference the, the section I'm, I'm looking at, um, just uh, and, and you know you can you can take a look at it and get us an answer. Um, it's uh, section 1.05 yeah, that, that reads section. the functions of the metropolitan government to be performed and the government services to be rendered throughout the entire general services district shall include a whole long list of things. One of which is um, hospitals. Right, and I. I believe there's another provision regarding uh, when services are no longer. Well, I'll, I'll look it up. We'll talk offline. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you. I just want to close with one question on that. If we're not able to come up with the additional money, and if we know that we're going to end, we're, we're in trouble in November, can, uh, Legal Director Cooper, I, this is, I'm, I'm coming back and following up here. Uh, if, when you study this, do we have some sort of obligation where we maybe bring other hospitals together to look at how we subsidize some of the things there? Is that an option? I think, we, we, I, unfortunately, I think we're going to have to look at what our options are. Did that, am I clear on what I, was, what I said or what I asked? It makes sense. To okay. What, I, what I'm saying is, is that if, in fact, we're, we're obligated under the charter to provide this type of service, can it be done other than at Metro General? Right. It's something certainly that we looked at. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Great. Um, seeing that looking at the side of the table. Um, Councilman O'Connell. Yeah, I just, I, I want to make sure I was either, you know, listening insufficiently carefully or that we've got enough clarity here on something that Councilman Holy dug into, right, which is looking at ways to overcome previous challenges, right? We've been through, those of us who are, you know, who've been here just since, uh, September of 2015 have gone through two emergency supplementals and we've got something to square here, right, which is the the, the Metro Finance perspective um, and, and having just heard from the Director of Finance and then the, the hospital perspective, which which sounds pretty dire, uh, squared against the, the Metro Finance perspective. So, you know, we, we see from this letter, right, $6 million in collection. How much of that $6 million has been brought back in since the letter was received in January of this year? In excess of two million. I do not have the exact number with me. Okay, we can so greater than zero. That. And, and I will have to say that during the time in which that information was provided in good faith to the board chair and the CEO, you were lacking any expertise whatsoever in revenue cycle. That number was created from a look at the accounts receivable as it sits, and what do we no what do we think we can normally get from that? Okay, we should be able to get about six million. It was their best estimate at the time, based upon the skill set of those individuals looking at it. Again, lacking any type right. of expertise. I, I see that it's clearly labeled a, a stretch goal, and you know, so I, I understand and appreciate that. That that was a lack of prevention. Okay. That is exactly what that stemmed from. Was a lack of preventive um, efforts and investment in the right areas to enable the, the revenue cycle is basically, it is what, exactly what it says, it is a cycle. Right. And when you break it, things like this happen. And and I appreciate your comments on, you know, how a sustained austerity scenario can lead to some bad choices that worsen the overall fiscal picture. To that end, I mean, maybe this is a related question. 
since that January 3rd letter, how many new late filings have accrued in terms of the dollar amount? Did We're not dealing with any new okay. timely filing issues. However, the accounts receivable, because it's an aging, so you have zero to 30, sure. 31 to 60, yep. each one is bucketed. Yep. You still have accounts receivable sitting there. Sure. That. But no new untimely filings? Um, nothing that um, I'm aware of in terms of new timely filing as it would have been occurred for services rendered in the last 30, 60 days, things like that, that um, during my tenure there, that has been a focus. Okay, and then the only other thing is when I was listening to the response, I wasn't sure if I heard this clearly. Would you say that the hospital authority is still specifically focused on overcoming the challenges by the bullet points laid out here and that this is something that is an aggressive priority of the of the authority to actually help manage costs? They're definitely dedicated to that. There's been a lot more education provided to the hospital authority board about cause and effect and how to prevent in the future as as well as how to manage some of those things now. Some of them require investment. Sure. I mean, and I get that, right? In order to improve the payer mix, you've got to be able to invest in, for instance, the marketing plan, et cetera. Physicians. Yes. Physicians, yeah. So, I mean, I, I understand that. I just, you know, I feel like I look at the gaps and I say, all right, have we actually moved the needle at all since January? I mean, you know, this is six months. This is... I feel like this has been a matter of some urgency. We've now, in the past year, seen a restructure of the board. We've obviously seen some new stuff uh, at the senior level, and I'm hopeful that that is helping move the needle, but I wasn't sure I got got all of that from your response to Councilman Pulley, so I just want to make sure that in every possible way that we can close the gap between the, the bad choices that maybe have even been forced by some of the austerity and, you know, the scenario where I think all of us, all 40 of us, are trying to square your request against the assessment from the, the, the finance department. You know, I, I want to make sure we're simultaneously putting some, some urgent pressure on <coughs> reducing those parts that might exist in that gap that help close it. So, you know, thank you for your response there. But I, I do want to, you know, stress that all of us now have, I think, a sense of the things that we've heard the authority say that they would do. We understand that there's some additional education, some potential investment necessary, but I want to make sure we don't move off of the necessary targets to go chase other things that might not help us close that gap. The only other area of focus that the board has, uh, otherwise uh, outside of ensuring pa uh, quality patient care, is the budget gap. So it's those items, quality patient care, and, and the gap, the, the pending gap in the budget. Um, I did want to correct something um, in terms of funding. I think it has been referenced many times about $50 million. And in speaking in that way, that is a hospital authority number. That's been a historic um, hospital authority number. That was during times when you had Bordeaux and Knowles. There is still legacy expenses related to Bordeaux and Knowles that unfortunately the hospital authority does not have revenue from so it's having to cover the legacy expenses out of its operating it spent out of its operating um, of that 35 million um, and looking at um, I believe it was 2016 in terms of true usable cash for the hospital out of the 35 million it ended up with less than 15 million in cash for operations um, there were several things that came out of that. So it's not a solid $35 million that gets dedicated to patient care at right. the hospital. Thank so you. $15 million is, is is very difficult number, and it resulted in an emergency request for funds. Thank you, Councilman. I know Councilman Foley had a follow-up. Just a quick follow-up, because I, I understood your answer was a bit different when we talked about the uh, $6 million or whatever the figure is for the uh, um, outdated untimely filings because uh, I thought you were telling me that you're still assessing this and uh, rather than throwing bodies at it uh, you still want to assess the situation but you couldn't tell me that the problem was solved so uh, meaning indicated that, that there are still these untimely filings out there meaning the problems that contribute to it are not are not solved 
the area of focus now is to ensure that bills are going out timely when there's appropriate information in order to bill it. So when I say that it's not occurring, meaning that they're working on the front end to try to prevent any new, but it is still occurring because you still have bills processing through the system. So it is still occurring? It does still occur as that bill moves through the system. All right. So I think Councilman O'Connell's question dealt with going back to January. So from January until now, we're still having issues with that. We do still have issues. They are significantly reduced. Mm -hmm. However, the process has not been, the process that creates the issue has not been completely eliminated. However, that is the highest focus that the, the small group that we currently do have is working on. So to his point and mine, I mean, our concern moving forward is going to be, and when we heard this last year, it was just really shocking to me that uh, we just essentially gave away that money because we didn't file timely. And we want that problem fixed. Absolutely. And if it's not fixed, we want to uh, really monitor it to see that it is because to me that's just a waste of money. It, it absolutely is, and that is something that I've discussed with all of leadership um, in, in the hospital, not just senior leadership, that it's important that we do everything that's necessary to get paid for the care that is provided with uh, with the payers that we do have. So it's a major focus. Yeah. Well, the last time we had this meeting in January and a while back, it was my understanding that she was going to hire some more people to take care of these late filings on these claims because you only most of them you only got 90 days to file them correct so you telling us today you still haven't hired anybody to do these filing of these claims um, no i indicated that we have two individuals that have been brought on uh, right. i indicated that in in our prior meeting as well i wasn't present for that for a, a january meeting but that was one of the first things that i suggested to the board was a restructuring of the revenue cycle which included the addition of staff there are actually a, there was a request for five staff We've started with two, so we get a full assessment, and we ensure that we bring on the appropriate type of staff to, to ensure that the gaps in the revenue cycle, which can occur from, from the time the patient is scheduled all the way through the time that the um, account is coded, that we've got the right people in the right places. So identifying where are the major gaps and making sure that we put people in those gaps and not just put a person on site. So we fill two of the positions. That was approved by the board. Those were unbudgeted positions. However, they more than pay for themselves in the amount of collections that you'll bring in. Those have been choices that have been poorly made in the fact of we don't have the money, so you don't have the money to get the money. That's it's certainly not the situation where you want to go into into the next year either. Thank so you. How, how many how many do you have filing the claims now? In terms of actually filing the claims, many of the claims are electronic. What you have is a holdup in the process to get the claim out electronically. So there is a vacancy of approximately five people um, that will need to be filled to try to shore that up. All right, and these are people that they have to be coded properly also. That is correct. That is part of that revenue cycle process. Right. Do you have people that know how to do those? We do coding? have people that are coding for us. Um, however, um, there is an opportunity for a, an assessment of that area that's also underway to see are we properly staffed in that? Are we making sure that we're coding every day and not just Monday to Friday and trying to save money by not having coding on weekends? Things like that, like the emergency room, revenue cycles 24-7 process as well. Thank so you. yes, it's it's identified and um, funding is necessary to uh, to fill the other positions as well. Thank you. Any follow-on questions? Oh. Yeah. Yes, Council Lady. Thank you. I just have a quick question about the the doctors. Well, many of the doctors we do not employ direct. Um, we do have a PSA agreement with Meharry, and it is a percentage of Medicare. So you could certainly have a more vibrant payer mix elsewhere, but as far as the amount of money that the physicians get paid by Meharry, I would not be privy to that. Only the amount of money we pay Meharry for services. So do you have a high turnover of the doctors? Um, I am unsure of their turnover rate. Um, we certainly do have unmet needs. We have um, patients that have not been able to be seen. There are long wait times um, due to insufficient staffing. But again, that also requires National General Hospital to have the money to pay for physician services uh, in order to meet those needs. What's the morale like? 
You know, I will have to say that uh, I ask that every, just about every morning morning report, and I ask, are you hearing everything? Natural General Hospital, what I tell people is that it is a family there, and families stick together, and that's what I see the employees doing. You know, they, you have many long-term employees, and you have many that are, that are new, that have chosen to come to Nashville General Hospital because of the caring environment. So I think that um, they certainly understand the situation that we're in for financial. It's not the first time they've been there. However, um, we have not seen a lot of flight in terms of staffing at this point. However, we haven't settled on what the, what the total number will finally be and what any potential cuts would have to be as a result of, of if the budget stays at $35 million. I, I think at that point you would certainly see a morale change. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. I know Council Lady. I just wanted to say, um, uh, as an interim CFO who's been at the hospital for five months, um, we all appreciate um, your energy level and your willingness to help educate us and answer our questions forthrightly. It's refreshing, and thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, thank you so much. Very grateful. Uh, this is probably the most challenging case that we have as council people in the budget this year. So I'm grateful to your. We're, we're I'm thankful that you asked the questions because I think you can make the most um, educated uh, decision when you have the appropriate information. So happy to provide anything that you need. I know it's a tough decision to make. There are a lot of needs out there. Hospital has a lot of needs. So if there's any additional information that you need, certainly let us know. Thank you. Um, one more part of our program, uh, our chief operating officer, to talk to us about body cameras, uh, the subject of body cameras. Um, being the $15 million in the CSP, uh, which has not been a number that I guess has been addressed with this council before, and so um, to talk about the scope of the program uh, going forward with the administration's proposal on body cameras, I was asked by Karen Johnson <coughs> that she certainly uh, understands and appreciates the administration's rollout plan in advance, so I guess it's been shared with her. But thank you, Mr. Reveley. Uh, she she grabbed me. Yes. 15 minutes ago, so that's that's Very the rollout. That's the rollout of uh, that she that she had because she said she had to leave. She's ahead of us. Thank you, and I will uh, I'll, I'll I will try to be brief, and if I'm not, uh, Talia will uh, yank me. Um, so as you know, we have we have proposed in the capital spending plan 15 million dollars for body cameras and and, and uh, car cameras, the dashboard cameras, which we believe at this time will be sufficient for the capital cost associated with this this plan. I um, want you to remember that um, we're not talking about a pilot project. Um, we think that uh, uh, doing a, a pilot project in one area of town or one community is probably not the way to do this, uh, but really to roll it out throughout the county for in, all, in all vehicles with all officers. It clearly is becoming the norm across the country to have body cameras and dashboard cameras. Uh, communities all over the country are doing moving in this direction, uh, and from every expert that I've talked to, uh, even those that aren't in favor necessarily of body cameras, do believe that that is that's the way we're going as as a nation as it comes to law enforcement is we're going to have uh, this this in in the in the facilities. Um, so when you look back to some of the numbers that you had seen before and how did we get from a a much larger number down to the $15 million number, I think there's several factors you got to look at. One of the largest factors is some $8 million of the original number was for the mobile laptops and printers for each of the vehicles and each of the squad cars. So that $8 million number is not really part of the body camera um, scenario. It has to be done in order to, to for the body camera technology to work but that is part of the ongoing needs of the police department to upgrade those facilities. Uh, and so because of the life cycle of those, uh, rather than doing 20-year bonds, long-term financing on those, that those will be financed out of 4% over the course of the next year, uh, which we think is the prudent way. Obviously, the uh, finance director concurs with that, I believe. <laughs> never yeah. never want to speak for the finance director. I've learned that in the uh, uh, learned that the hard way, I guess I should say. Um, so, so that's a big chunk of that number is, is going to be handled out of 4%. Uh, an, an, another large group, a large amount of that was related to um, 
Part of it was for some pay increases uh, uh, for police officers, which uh, we felt we handled through the normal pay increase process and didn't see that as being appropriate at this time. Uh, and then there's some staffing needs that are associated with this that will be obligated in the future. Um, so we are now at the preparing the RFP stage. It's not been finalized yet. We would hope that so, uh, if, the fund, if the funds are made available in the spending plan, council approves that, uh, that we would go out with the RFP in, uh, in, in July. Um, you don't really want to, I don't really want to put the RFP out unless we know we have the funding for the, for the <coughs> it's sort of, I think, inappropriate to put out an RFP if you don't have funding for something. Um, so we would put out the RFP in, um, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in July. Uh, it's going to be structured so that there will be ample opportunity to test all the various uh, pot potential equipment. So the sort of pilot will be done through the through the uh, through the bud the bid uh, the procurement process, where the police and others can try out the various equipment that's available and come up you know and see what's there, and then you put out the actual bids will be sub submitted, and then we'll you know we'll see where the you know where that all ends up at once the uh, once the bids come in. Um, so that's going to take. You know, four six months at least, I would think, in order to get through that process. So we don't really envision there will be a lot of capital, excuse me, operating dollars needed in the fiscal 18 budget because of the timing it'll take to get the equipment ordered. Once you once you make a decision, then you got to order the equipment, you got to get it submitted in, and all that. So there will be some additional uh, operating needs for the fiscal 19 budget. Uh, which will address, you know, accordingly, and that sort of makes up a lot of the difference in terms of the cost. Um, I would believe, you know, the plan I believe for the police department is that once the uh, once the orders are in, they will probably, uh, uh, on a precinct by precinct basis, roll this out, uh, so that in a matter of a, a relatively short period of time, uh, the entire county will be, uh, and all the all the vehicles in the entire county will have access to the equipment. So. That's sort of how we got to the $15 million. You obviously won't know until you do the, uh, until you get the RFP and you get the bids in. I should also say that the, the, the original proposal that was talked about, you know, had more than two cameras for every, for every squad car. So it had like 3,200 cameras when we have 1,400 or so uh, police officers. So it was a, it was a much larger uh, uh, equipment or not saying that we're not going to need some backup. But I think once you have a vendor uh, online, uh, you can probably get back up much more quicker than you can. And we don't need to order all of that initially, um, as, as was presented in the original proposal. So that's sort of how we got to the $15 million number. But again, we really won't know until, uh, if that's adequate, until we get the, uh, until we do the, take the proposals and get the RFP in, the bids in. Thank you. Question? Council. So, all right, so under this plan, then, every uh, car, I'm assuming motorcycle, all, all police-occupied vehicles will have cameras on them. So yes, we're, we're not going to do one part of town and not, and so everybody's going to be covered. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just, I think it's just, um, you're either going to be all, this is, you know, you're either all, all in or you're not. And, and, and I think you have to be because I can't tell you where the next incident is going to occur. If we could predict that, then we yeah. could say, well, we're just going to put them in this, this precinct. Yeah, and I, but obviously I don't disagree you can't. with yeah. that. I, I, yeah. I mean, if we're going to do it, yeah. I agree now, with Now, it won't be done all the same day, obviously. Right. It's going to take a couple months probably to roll it all out once you know the equipment. But I would think by the end of the, you know, by the, end of, uh, the next fiscal year, they, we should have them in, in almost every vehicle, if not all. Right. Then the second question, uh, we've heard from uh, General Funk today that, it, you know, for every 40, I think, it's going to require an additional paralegal, and I could not hear what he said as far as number of additional lawyers. Are you working with the DA's office to, to pre-plan for what yeah, that I mean, additional cost we, is? We had those numbers were included in, in General Funk's budget submission this year because, you know, he didn't know when this was all going to happen. So we have the numbers that the police department submitted for their, they, they think on, because they're going to need additional uh, information officers to handle the request. They're going to, you know, uh, 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 IT people to, 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 you know, to look at the, the equipment and all that. So there's a number in, and we will be rolling through that, you know, as of course of the budget process over the next year. Uh, and so that when we make a, a budget submission, when those departments make a budget submission next year, we'll pre hopefully be really comfortable with what they've asked for. Do you have any idea of what that's going to look like? 
It's not an insignificant number, uh, Councilman, to be honest with you. I, I, I don't recall, um, I mean, we can, we can get what was submitted this year. We, we can send you what was submitted this year, but it's, it's in the millions of dollars. I mean, it's not, a, again, it's not a small amount of money on an annual basis. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, Councilman. Um, thank you for being here, Richard. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, let's make this as Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah it's, it, we're getting close right. to you. Yes. <laughs> um, we all met with, well, some of us here at this table met with the people from Taser and the other company that came and presented the options, the two biggest companies in the country here that make body cameras for police officers and cars and everything else, and as well as storage systems. In private meetings with them, their number was somewhere between six and a half and eight million to equip our entire police force, body cameras, cars, everything else. I I'm wondering why we're allocating 15. Storage costs no, is that was one of it. Including storage. Storage, well, I mean, I, I think, Councilman, just to be honest with you, we don't know until we get proposals. I'm not okay, proposing. So we're just, we have to spend, I mean, we're, we're not going to spend 15 million if we don't have to, trust me. Okay. But we don't, but we, we think that that was the right number to put into the plan. I hope it's 5 million. 10 million and for, to the good, but um, you know, just because we have the 15 million budget, it doesn't mean we'll spend it. Uh, and I think because going through this competitive process, we're going to get a good price. They obviously are going to want to do our business because it's a lot of cameras. Yeah. And so they're going to be, I, I hope, pretty aggressive in the pricing. And and this is a, you know, this is a, a you know, you know, we're a big city and. You know, this would be a, a feather in anybody's cap to, to, to get be. the National Police Department. And, and, and publicly, I'm all for it. I think we should. I agree totally that uh, we need to do it all at one time. Right. right. So. And, I, and I, I share your, I hope it, I hope it's far less than that. Um, Thank you. Councilman Leonardo. <laughs> Two quick questions. I think it's a wonderful thing, but I think if we don't have the policy right and roll this out right. Mr. Evening, we're going to set the city back 100 No, no, years. no question so, about that. So well, you're a lawyer, and I, I guess it's for both you and I, I try not to remind people that. Please don't, please don't. <laughs> are, are you guys satisfied that we have a workable policy that has, you know, deals with chain of custody and all these other issues that are going to surround us being used in the legal process? I think we do, yeah. I mean, that, you know, we had this citizens uh, advisory group that met, met and came up with the policies. I think, you know, it'll be, it'll be con consistently refined fine over over time but as you know the course that we do this we'll make sure that the DA's office the public defender's office the legal department the police department all have you know another another uh, another bite at the apple to make sure we have good procedures but if you recall FOP was was on that committee uh, and they supported the uh, final result so I think we're in a in a in a relatively good place uh, not to say it's perfect but I think we're uh, we're well ahead of um, of more many communities are when they first went into this and sort of got into it a little too fast and then it, it came back to, to sort of haunt them. I, I think we're going at it the right way and we'll be, uh, we'll be there to protect everybody who needs to be protected, citizens, police, everyone, uh, in a way that's fair for all. And my final question is that, I think you may have answered this or alluded to it, I mean, these are going to be used for prosecution as well. Sure. Okay, and so once there's... It will be publicly available. Yep. And once there's a conviction, then it has to be stored forever. Yes. And so do we have really any kind of idea, because we're committing ourselves to a long-term, you know... Yeah, I, I think the police, uh, the police, I think when they presented their original budget was, was very expensive. And I think it's because a lot of that is for the long-term storage of, of, of this stuff. The police feel very strongly about controlling the storage and not uh, having it up in the cloud. They want to be able to control it. They think it's important uh, for, uh, for uh, just all the legal reasons, the chain of custody and all that. Uh, and we'll see how that plays out once the, once the proposals come in. But it, it, it will, the, the RFP is written to strongly recommend that that's, that's what the city would prefer. And we'll see what the cost is and if it makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. Councilman Hager. Thanks, Rich, for being here. Have we looked at other cities and what their costs have been for the body? We cameras? have some numbers, and, 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 and I think, as, as Councilman Swope alluded to, uh, we might be a little on the high side, but this is a pretty big, you know, not, I don't know, not too many places have done this size yet. Um, you know, New York has some of those other places. Yeah, that's why I think yeah. is we, I go to Gallatin yeah. and Williamson County, and all of them have got the body cameras. Yeah. And matter of fact, some of the motorcycle officers have the cameras in their sunglasses. Their sunglasses. Wow. But they're they're pretty. Uh, Again, uh, they're pretty good. The, you know, anytime you know, we think the 15 is will be enough, but we won't know until we do it. But we're not going to spend money foolishly. We'll make sure. You know, the pub bids are all going to be publicly acknowledged, so everyone will see the numbers uh, as we go. Yeah, forward. I think the state troopers have them too. Am I right? I don't know if they have they the, got the, the on the inside of the glasses. I think. They got what? <laughs> 
I know they got the cameras, but I didn't know if they got the body cameras or not. I don't I, think they have them yet. I'm not positive. I don't yeah, because I get access to their police cameras all the time when I need it. So, okay. Thank Count, you. Council lady. So how long will the computers last? Five years yeah, it's years. probably a five-year cycle for the for the. I think we but it seems like. It's a very little older than five years. Yeah, they may be they may be a little on that because I knew the the police the chief has made that his that is his top priority in terms of technology is getting those first, and so we'll we'll be going out with that procurement relatively soon. Uh, you know, once a four percent thing gets done in probably July or August. Yeah, probably July. What percentage did you allocate for that? Uh, it's eight million dollars. Yeah. So what's the life cycle for these cameras? I don't think I don't know that yet. I think it's long. It's it's it should be longer it. than that. Do you know about? I don't know. It, it depends. Both companies have offered to do pretty much automatic upgrades on a yearly basis for wow. like relatively nothing. Um, but life cycle on any one of these cameras, as long as they're not thrown against the wall on a regular right. basis, it, it's three to five years. Yeah. Yeah. And then the technology is going to change. These cameras are probably worth less. Well, that's what the, obviously the storage is where they hope to. Uh, to, to it it is, and, and and if we're not going to store on the cloud storage, right, that's going to be the trade-off. It gets substantially more expensive. Right, that's the trade-off that we have to see when we get the proposals, and we'll make yeah. a, a you know a, a business decision. Well, it's more than a business decision; it's a it's a it's a legal decision as well. Yes. Uh, but cloud storage, it'd be the equipment is much cheaper because yeah. they they're getting the money on the cloud. If you're going to control it yourself, then they're going to charge you more for the equipment, and that's what that'll be the the balance that we have to come up with and make a determination when we get to the mm -hmm. We have to hire a lot more people to control it ourselves. Yes. Yeah, and, and council lady, let, let me add for the viewing audience at home, there might be some mixture of both. Yeah. To the tune where things that we're going to roll off in a year anyway live on the cloud. And the longer second term it becomes a PD yeah. or a DA's yeah. Yeah. thing, it comes into local storage. The second it has to be stored in perpetuity, it goes onto our servers and comes completely off. The it gets complicated because you know you can, you know, you might be a year before somebody you know you need it. Statue of limitations. Yeah, and all that kind of stuff because of the, you, know, yeah. the, you know nobody reported anything, but then a year out somebody said, well, hey, I was <laughs> something happened. So it's it's not nothing simple about this. No, it's complicated. I think we're, you know, we've got a good team working on it and, and you know, we'll have a good proposal and a uh, good plan and I think it'll be, uh, everyone will feel good about it. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you, Council Levy. Any further questions? Thank you, members. I want to thank everybody for being here. Oh, we ran a little long. Oh, yes. Not related to anything we talked about. Uh, it came to my attention, and I'm counselor to legal counsel Cooper. It came to my attention today. Uh, I thought because uh, Councilman Tiger had spoken about Hillwood uh, property being very valuable, what would we do with it if Hillwood High School moved, etc. It came to my attention today, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I'd like to find out. Is the land that that high school is sitting on, does it have a reversion deed on it? No. It does not. Okay, so that has been checked. It, it, there was a restriction in the deed which was satisfied when the school was built. Okay. So so like all other property, the school board will make a determination okay. what they want to do with that property and, and make a recommendation and ultimately the school board act and the council would have to act on okay. that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you're talking on, on the record that Hillwood property had special policy with, to remain as a school, if it's not option is variable as a community center, if it's not option is available, keep as a uh, property bank as a you know whenever you need uh, the land for a school. So we do have those as three layered special policy. So it's developing and selling and developing is not on the option. I just want to make it sure on the record. Thank you, Council Lady. Thank everybody. Uh, we ran a little bit late, but I'm grateful for everybody's time. Appreciate it. <coughs>